This is Long John with the party line. We're around from midnight to 5.30, six mornings during the week. During that time, we have the pleasure of talking with many interesting people. And, of course, on Mondays, we get started about 1. We continue right through to 5.30. 37 and a half hours a week talking with interesting people. I think some of you people remember that the other night I mentioned on the program that we would be talking... Tonight, to a gentleman who gave a lecture at the New York Center. And uh, I'm referring to Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke. Mr. Clarke is one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject of space flight. Mr. Clarke is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and for five years was chairman of the British Interplanetary Society. He is a well-known author, and among his books are the following. Exploration of Space, Interplanetary Flight, Childhood's End, Against the Fall of Night, and Sands of Mars. I frankly do not know what the Mr. Clark's opinions may be as far as flying saucers are concerned, but I feel very confident that before we reach the hour of 5.30 that we'll know. And of course, our good friend Cortland Hastings is with us this morning, <coughs> and Charles Leadham. Mr. Leadham is an author as well as a TV producer. The gentleman who I think will be of great interest to us tonight as well as Mr. Clark is a gentleman by the name of Major Wayne S. Aho. Mr. Aho was on the program a few months ago, and I would like to mention at this time that Major Aho and Cortland Hastings will be giving a lecture at the New York Center Thursday, February 6th at 8 p.m. The address is 227 West 46th Street in the city of New York. Subject, what can you do about flying saucers? Now, Court has been on the program many times. The Major's been with us once before, and no doubt many of our listeners who are interested in the subject of flying saucers will certainly want to attend that lecture. Again, let me remind you, it's Thursday, February 6th at 8 p.m., New York Center, 227 West 46th Street. Major Aho is going to give us some of his opinions tonight about flying saucers. And he also is going to give us the official statement of Major Donald E. Kehoe. I understand that in this statement, which will be read to us, we will learn possibly for the first time what actually happened on the night of the telecast of the Armstrong Circle Theater, January 22nd over CBS. Later, I have been told, Major Aho will also tell us of newspaper and radio reports of sightings of flying saucers being seen overhead by audiences of Dr. George Hunt Williamson as they left the lecture halls in the various cities on the West Coast, during which one reporter not only witnessed it, but also took photos. And we have a lot of other interesting material for you this morning. Major A. Hull... Since uh, that Armstrong Circle Theater telecast, there's been a lot of stories going around about what happened. I don't want to know the facts at the moment, but I was just wondering. Do you think when a person claims that they've seen a flying saucer that they should be put into a mental hospital? Well, John, I, I don't believe they should. Uh, if uh, that is the case, why, uh, there'd be 
thousands of uh, people in the world right today in mental institutions who have had these sightings all over the world. And uh, if we went so far as putting the people that um, had these sightings, had these experiences in the hospital, and we'd uh, no doubt have to hospitalize the witnesses also, uh, because there are a number of witnesses in uh, many of these uh, reported sightings. Uh, that is something that um, I would just like to discuss at um, some length later this evening and uh, discuss the uh, very interesting case of Reinhold Schmidt in Kearney, Nebraska, and uh, bring to light everything that has happened up until now. Do you believe the Schmidt story? Well, uh, let's put it this way, um, John. I wasn't there. I wasn't a witness. But uh, I believe that um, uh, the man's story has possibilities. And uh, if uh, his statement can be borne out that uh, there were three or four other witnesses that saw this same ship, and uh, the fact that uh, these uh, reported landings, these reports came from uh, many parts of the nation. I have um, uh, with me some uh, news this evening about uh, uh, a similar type of um, uh, landing story from Long Beach, California. And uh, when you uh, add that to the uh, Loveland, Texas uh, incidents and uh, White Sands, New Mexico and uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and the fact that these are all occurring about the same day with no uh, relationship between them, the parties did not know each other and they occurred uh, almost simultaneously, uh, then we should begin to consider that uh, perhaps the Reinhold Schmidt uh, story did have some merit. And just because you've heard a lot of other stories, Major Aho, you feel that there's a possibility that the Schmidt story is true? Uh, well, John, I have um, I received uh, several uh, letters from uh, Reinhold Schmidt. Uh, I am aware that um, <clears throat> that right today uh, he's back at the uh, the scene of operations. Uh, many people uh, know that he was um, uh, sent to a mental institution in. Uh, uh, Hastings, Nebraska, which I think we should uh, discuss at some length when you uh, mm -hmm. want to go into that part of the program. He's out, though, now. He's out, and uh, he claims to have passed every test he demanded, according to his letter, every test they could give him, and he passed these tests. And uh, the same company that had sent him originally to Kearney, Nebraska, as a grain buyer, uh, put him right back in Kearney, Nebraska, still in their employ. So I, uh, apparently some people have faith in the man. I spoke the other day to the uh, newscaster who's with the Mutual Broadcasting System in Kearney, Nebraska. Actually, he called me, and he was in the hotel room with uh, Mr. Schmidt at the time. And uh, he was under the impression that I had made an announcement that as Schmidt heard <coughs> through somebody else that I had made an announcement on this program that I knew that there were witnesses to the story. Well, I hadn't said that. And evidently, Mr. Schmidt had the idea that possibly I would know the names and addresses of these additional witnesses, alleged witnesses. And frankly, I do not know them. I know nothing about it. Uh, Court? Yeah, I uh, wanted to add one small addendum there, John. I understand that what one size? of these... What uh, Very short one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one of the eminent citizens of that town was a witness to this very thing. But because of the ridicule which was heaped upon it and the great amount of censure and opprobrium, he considered it much better for the safety of his own skin and the safety of his own reputation to remain incognito. But he yeah. told individuals that he had seen it, but refused to let his name be used. I don't want to know the source of your information, but may I just ask you this. Is this hearsay? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there either, John, so I can't say, but I would say the source was quite reliable. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into our discussion with the other guests this morning, let me take a moment to talk about this offer. You heard uh, the statement that was made by Major Aho a moment ago. And I was just wondering, as an astronomer, and also I understand that you were five years chairman of the British Interplanetary Society, 
I think with that background, you possibly have some opinion about the possibility of saucers being interplanetary. Yes, uh, I think it's only a matter of time before we're visited from space. In fact, I had an article in Harper's Magazine about uh, three or four months ago called Where's Everybody, which was on this very theme. There are at least 100,000 million suns in this one universe of ours, and we're probably a pretty backward section of it. And we've only been civilized, if we are civilized, for a very short period of time. I'm sure there'll be thousands of civilizations out there among the stars with very much higher uh, standards than ours, and they have space travel and interstellar travel. So it's certainly only a matter of time before we're visited. Now, when you say, Mr. Clark, it's only a matter of time, are you implying that possibly they haven't arrived here as well, yet? I should think it's very probable they've arrived scores of times in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's even possible they've arrived in historic time. I mean, in, since there's been uh, men who've recorded these things. I mean, some of Charles Fort's uh, accounts are very hard to explain any other way except the arrival of spaceships in the Earth's atmosphere. But I don't think they're arriving now. You don't think they're arriving now? When no. you say that, do you mean today? Well, I mean, I don't think they've arrived. Or during the last in the last months? In the last, uh, during the century, say. During the century, mm -hmm. you don't feel that any saucers or UFOs have arrived here from other planets. Of course, I can't prove this, but it's mm -hmm. my feeling that they haven't arrived. I mean, on, all, on the basis of all the evidence that you understand. If you feel that they have arrived here from time to time from other planets, why is it that uh, they have stopped during the past century? Well, I don't say they've stopped, but the problem is this. Uh, suppose you have to conduct a survey of 100,000 million suns. Mm -hmm. You have only a limited number of survey ships. Well, at a very rough estimate, you could probably only survey any one system every few thousand or few million years. And I su suggest that somewhere in some enormous central filing system there'll be a, a file on Earth with a very interesting information about it, a few thousand years out of date, saying that this planet may be worth visiting in, say, what well, might be the year 5000 A.D. to us. And they'll, they'll work around for us again sooner or later. I'm a little speechless at this time. <laughs> Charles? Ah, uh, yes. Well, Are you going home? <clears throat> I, I'm going to go look for this file card, to tell you the truth. The thing that uh, curiosifies me Eric, is this. Why must they have come, say, in Paleolithic times, and why couldn't it have been, you know, two weeks ago last Monday that they brought the final card up to date? Well, it could be any time. I'm just pointing out the statistics of it. The Earth has been here for, let's say, five billion years, take a nice round figure, roughly five billion years. Mm, We've been not four billion Well, <laughs> well let's stick to five. I like the nice round numbers. <laughs> five billion. We've been here, let's say... Uh, as a roughly civilized race for perhaps 5,000 years. One, mm -hmm. one millionth of that total time. Mm -hmm. So that's why the chances of anything coming along in that period of time are fairly small. Now, as to why I don't think that there are any uh, visitors from space as of now, if somebody tells me they have seen a unicorn in Central Park, I say, very interesting, you may be right. If there really is a unicorn in Central Park, there will be no doubt whatsoever about the matter in a very short period of time. Similarly, if there really are spaceships hovering around this Earth, that is the sort of thing which will be settled as unequivocally as the existence of unicorns in Central Park in a very short <coughs> period of time. They'll be tracked, photographed, observed in every possible way. Well, Arthur, I, I personally do not buy the flying saucer thing, but I think there's an angle... Of motivation here, the unicorn in Central Park, I doubt would have would much care whether or not he was established. But if if our file keepers from Planet X uh, want to do an anonymous survey, why well, then they might you know very well keep out of the way most of the time. But they might slip a few times, and uh, a few gentlemen might see them. Yes, but if they slipped at all, there wouldn't be much doubt about that. That's not the sort of thing that you can keep quiet. I mean, it's. Like the girl who said that her baby was a very small one. I mean, this is an all-or-nothing operation. <laughs> sure enough. That I cannot fight. Uh, Arthur Clark, uh, 
On this program, I've had the pleasure and the opportunity of talking with a lot of people, and I would say I've spoken to at least oh, eight or ten people who claim that uh, they have had uh, physical contact with Venusians and Martians, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, two or possibly three of these people claim that they've been in saucers and they've visited other planets. How do you feel about those things, Mr. Clark? Well, now, all these people who claim to have had physical contact and to ridden in, to are actually ridden in space vehicles, mm -hmm. they fall into three categories. Some of them are fooling you. Mm -hmm. Some of them really believe it and are insane. Others are possibly hoaxed by other people. You and know, no, somebody is fooling... They have, someone may have fooled... Someone of rather <coughs> uh, simple intelligence may have been fooled by some unscrupulous friends who could possibly have kidded them into thinking they had met someone from a flying saucer. I'm sure that, that has happened occasionally. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be interested to meet the man who could bring down this, you know, 60-foot pulsating object through the sky to fool some of these people. Well, this is the guy I want to get in contact with. Well, I'm not discussing any particular case. I'm just generalized. Portland? I take it that Mr. Clark feels an impossibility for somebody to have a physical contact. Is that right, Mr. Clark? It's a, it's a possibility. It'll happen sooner or later. The point is, when it happens, there'll be no doubt about it. Well, why do you say that? Because this sort of thing does not happen in out-of-the-way places to obscure people. Oh, well, if you say it's never happened before, how can you make a statement that it won't happen in out-of-the-way places? Because it'll happen, if it does happen, even in out-of-the-way places, that place will not remain out-of-the-way very long. Well, what would bring it in out of the way? Pardon? What would bring it in out of the way? Well, listen, let's speak. Suppose that there is someone, uh, say, a reconnaissance group, surveying this planet, as I, which, as I said, is quite possible, and I think ultimately is a certainty. Well, now, what, are, what will their procedure? If they're anthropologists, they'll make contact with people, and um, they'll work up from that. But the sort of reports we've had so far are so unconvincing and so trivial and they're also they're so <clears throat> contradictory they just uh, I don't see how you can possibly take any basis of seriousness in them Mr. Clark I'm interested in the statement that you just made that you feel that the flying <coughs> saucers would not contact an obscure person is that right sir? oh no no oh. I, they wouldn't just um, for instance, the all the reports I've said, well, the, the, most of the people who have claimed to have made contact with yes. flying saucers, mm -hmm. um, the fact that they're obscure has nothing to do with it. But they're, let's say, also peculiar, many of them. And I don't think you can deny that. Now, I'm not going to give any names, but I think you can fill in the blanks quite easily yourselves. Well, no, no, I'd like to get back to... Didn't you use the word obscure... I did use that word, and what I will ratify it. Okay. They would, uh, they would, might, they might make contact first of all with, say, anybody they they came up against. But you know that uh, little famous cartoon, "Take Me to Your President." Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing. It will happen very soon after they have made contact with anybody. I, I'm interested in in your thinking on this, Mr. Clark. You made a statement a little while ago that you thought that possibly saucers or UFOs or spacecraft, that is, interplanetary craft, had arrived on this planet, but possibly not for the past hundred years. Now, if this is true, and let us say that 150 years ago, some uh, interplanetary craft landed on this planet and they accidentally contacted an obscure person, don't you think that that person would have taken the Venusians or the Martians to somebody of importance so that we would have a record of it in our history? I think that's very likely, and that is one of the best arguments against this happening in the historic times. So uh, you have fairly well convinced me that it hasn't happened for this reason. Your argument is a really sound one. So we might as well wrap it up for a night? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that would be most disappointing. We can go back to, say, about 2000 B.C., and then we'll...
What would have happened? It would have been lost. I mean, the whole That's historical... That's true. Well, the point is it's very it little... It hasn't been, actually. Yes, but there's very little point in discussing these cases because you can never prove them one way or the other, the early cases. They can never be proved. You can argue around them till kingdom come. And uh, there's no way that I can see, unless you make a time machine, of proving that that really was an extraterrestrial contact. So we are really stuck with the modern sightings, if you want to do anything. Mm-hmm. Cortland? Um, as long as we're back to 2000 B.C., which is a rather interesting and round date. Uh, I don't you like round figures. <laughs> sure. A friend of mine is an Egyptologist, and uh, he's been doing quite a bit of study in that. And he says that in the Book of the Dead, there are numerous references to spaceships or machines from space. Uh, there is some reference to sun, and some people say that these are suns. But in the next paragraphs or so, it will be mentioned that these machines blot out the sun. And there are numerous references to the pharaohs going out to have conversations with these people as being those beings from outer space of greater wisdom than our own. Well, I mean, I could match dozens of these cases from... Uh yeah, you can take things in the Bible. I mean, you can prove up thousands of yeah. cases, quite convincing, but you could not prove them, but you can build up some very interesting cases, but you can never prove them or disprove them. So, Ray, there's not much we <clears throat> can do on the matter. The thing that, so, the thing ahead, that surprises Charlie. me is that so much uh, credence is attached to Egyptian mythology. Why not go into Norse mythology and talk about Valhalla and the ice gods and so forth as being, who knows, maybe frozen flying saucers? What, what is so... You know, what is so much with Egypt in the Book of the Dead? This is what I don't understand. Well, there's some very good cases in, in the Ceylonese mythology. I happen to live in Ceylon now, and there's cases in the uh, sacred writings of Ceylon going back to about uh, 500 B.C., where there are stories of flying machines and so on, which are quite convincing. Well, the Book of the Dead is an extremely important book. It happens to be one of the bases. That's why I was referred to I'd like to go back, however, to the uh, point of actual contact here of much more contemporary nature than 2000 B.C. That is a little bit long. I would like to mention, uh, or go back, say, to 1947, in which uh, Army Air Force intelligence officers had been investigating reports of unidentified flying objects at very high speeds in in various sections of the United States. And on September 23rd, and in fact on July 8th, the Air Corps statement at the Pentagon is, and I quote, we are investigating a flying disc report by Navy rocket engineer CT Zone and three other rocket scientists. Now we assume that these rocket scientists would know a <coughs> UFO from something with which they were familiar And on September 23rd of 1947, the official analysis report from the Air Technical Intelligence Center, that's where we investigate these things, Mr. Clark, out at uh, the Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, to General Hoyt Vandenberg, who incidentally was a friend of my superiors and a very close one, uh, commanding general at that time of the Army Air Corps, and I quote, the reported phenomena are real, end quote. Now, there is no question there as to what they're thinking. Those words are incisive. I think there's a great deal of question as to what they're thinking. They say the reported phenomena are real, end quotes, and anything beyond that is what you read into it and is subject to a lot of question. They mean that they are real, that they are not anything that we have, Charles, and that they obviously are coming from outer space. Uh, Uh, Portland, how do you know what they mean? Because I am about to read 1938. Good, this is what I would like to know. (laughs) You did that great. That was a good production. (laughs) Thanks, Charles. You're a good end man (laughs) here. You're a good middleman, too, Um, The Air Corps in 19... Well, in 1948, July 24th, Seldom get the chance. By General Thanks again. George we'll talk C. To you Kennedy, later. Thank you. who is at that time chief of the Strategic Air Command. After the so-called spaceship sighting by the pilots and a passenger of an Eastern Airlines plane, stated, We're completely mystified. We have nothing remotely like the machine described. I wish we did. End quote. That doesn't mean that they're interplanetary, though, quite. They may be from a foreign <clears throat> government. It doesn't even mean they're machines. 
It says we but, have all he said is we have nothing remotely like what was described by the witnesses, which means absolutely nothing to me. In August, the date was withheld, but a top-secret estimate of the situation by the Air Technical Intelligence Center, later declassified but never released, stated that flying saucers were inter- interplanetary spaceships. What was that again? Flying saucers. Now, who, who said that? A top-secret estimate of the situation. This is a document. This is do you realize... Declassified, but not really. Do you realize that recently, I think it was just today, there was declassified a document on the use of bows and arrows in warfare, which was classified by mistake, Mr. Hastings? A lot of this top-secret classified secret estimate, which may have been by a corporal and a demented corporal at that, is not very impressive. I'm not trying to impress by whether it was classified or declassified. Oh, I see. Well, what, what is the impressive it part? Released. What is the impressive part of this statement? We've been leading up with my end man bit here for five minutes to this statement. <laughs> now, what is the impressive part of it? Well, I guess I don't speak good English. It no. said the flying saucers were interplanetary spaceships. And, and this, as question. far as I know, this was made by a demented corporal at Dayton, Ohio. Now, how do you know any different? No, it was made by a rather, a rather higher level than that. It was made by a number of quite competent authorities who, uh-huh. had, who had access to the information and who came to this conclusion, as I think many reasonable men would do, if their knowledge of atmospheric optics and natural phenomena was not complete. Then uh, you're, you're trying to go along with uh, uh, Dr. Menzel of Harvard. Oh, no, I don't go in long entirely with him, but <clears throat> the, most of the confusion in this subject is caused by mixing up two entirely separate things. One, UFOs. I think UFOs probably exist. And the other so-called flying saucers, which are our vehicles, definite vehicles, which are a totally different thing, and which don't exist. Flying saucers are different from UFOs, and according to your opinion, Mr. Clark, flying saucers do not exist, but there's a great possibility that UFOs do. I would say that there's a 99% possibility that UFOs do exist, and a 1%, and only a 1% possibility that flying saucers as interplanetary vehicles exist. Well, Mr. Clark, I wonder if you could tell me what a UFO is. Well, let me go back to, I'll be very glad to, let me go back to this report of these mm-hmm. gentlemen who decided... The one that Cortland is yeah, talking about? Decided, in view of the fact, uh, these, uh, these reports and this evidence, that these things were really interplanetary vehicles. <clears throat> this is a conclusion I came to myself about, for about that time as a result of these reports. And it wasn't until I'd seen about six UFOs myself that I decided that I realized they were not spaceships. The point is that um, there are far more fantastic things in the sky than anybody realizes, even the trained observer who spends a lot of time looking at the sky. And I don't see how anyone hearing all these reports and not seeing them could really fail to think they were spaceships. But they're not spaceships when you were to analyze the evidence. Now, let me give my reasons for thinking this. Um, first of all, as I say, I heard all these reports, these sightings, made by competent people, and, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't say they were all lying. And they were very convincing and very extraordinary and very inexplicable. And then, as I traveled around the world, I've been around the world a couple of times in the last uh, five years, I saw quite a few strange things. And I have now seen, I've just been listing them, I have seen uh, six UFOs. Uh, by that I mean objects which were quite inex- inexplicable when I saw them, uh, which could easily been inter- uh, have been interpreted as spaceships, which took a lot of explaining, and often the, the explanations were so fantastic I almost hesitate to give them. But in every case I was able to find out what they were. But I am sure that 99% <coughs> of the people who had seen them would have decided they were spaceships, but they were not. Now, this is happening all the time. Now, can I give some examples of things I saw to show you what I mean? Please do. Well, I was in London one day, on bright summer's day, uh, somewhere near Regent's, Regent Street, and I saw a lot of people looking up at the sky. And I looked up, too. And there, a long way up, were two black spheres close together, quite motionless in the sky. There was a very strong wind blowing at the time, and these two black discs or spheres just were absolutely motionless over the center of London. I'll come back to this in a minute. I'll go on to my next sighting. 
I was in Brisbane, Australia, on my first underwater expedition to the Great Barrier Reef. And one evening, uh, I was in a building about five or six floors up, looking out towards the sunset, and I saw, to my astonishment, a whole string of uh, brilliant silver discs, uh, elliptic, roughly elliptical, uh, flip-flopping across the horizon quite slowly with a curious oscillating movement. And I said, good heavens, this is, this is it, you see. And I watched them go right across the sky. And this was absolutely convincing, these oscillating silver discs moving slowly. Well, that was uh, the second case. I'll give you a third case before I come back to the earlier two, if you don't mind me taking so much of <laughs> your time. Again, I was in Australia, in Sydney, and I saw an extraordinarily shaped uh, cloud. It looked like a cloud, except it had rather uh, solid edges, uh, hanging above the city of Sydney. And this again, uh, again, there was a strong wind blowing, and this cloud stayed in the same place and slightly altered its shape, but it like, looked like an amoeba. It was hanging over Sydney, and despite the, in one place, despite the fact there was a very strong wind blowing. Well, I've given these three things, and I'd like to know if you... I, I, I'll tell mm -hmm. you, can you explain them? I'll tell you what they were in a minute, but these are the things I saw. I've described, I've described them as carefully as I can. Would you care to try? The two, uh, black, di the two black discs in a high wind of motionless over the middle of London, the string of silver uh, ellipses flip-flopping across the sky along the horizon, and this weird amoeba-shaped cloud, motionless in a high wind over the middle of the great city. No, these sound like uh, regular descriptions. Quite well, fine sausage. And I mean, I like to hear what you. Uh, well, now, if I, if, if anyone right. had told me they had seen these things, I would have been forced to accept them as inexplicable uh, flying saucers, so inex perhaps some kind of artifact. Well, the first one was an artifact. The the two black discs close together, high over London. I was like. If I hadn't gone to Regent's Park, I wouldn't have found out what it was. It was a kid flying a very large box kite that must have been about a mile up. But it was so high that its structure was... You couldn't see what it was, and of course you... I mean, you don't associate kite flying in the middle of London, but it was a box kite at such a height that it looked like two black spots side by side. Or in the middle of London. Was about I went to Regent's <coughs> Park and saw the kid flying oh, so it. you saw the... the I, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was a high, I've never seen a kite so high. I mean, I, I say about a mile up, that's a rough guess, but you could not tell it was a kite because it was so high. Now, this is, you may say, is a simple case, but this is the sort of thing that can start reports, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm almost ashamed to tell you what the, what the flipping discs were, uh, because this sounds so trite, and I had read this in books and I had not believed it. They were seagulls catching the setting sun. Now, listen, before you laugh at me, I was born by the sea. I have lived by the sea nearly all my life. I live by the sea now. I have seen seagulls a million times, but only once in my life have I seen this phenomenon. Under certain conditions of illumination with a low sun, uh, seagulls and other birds produce an absolutely convincing impression of metallic disks moving, uh, oscillating across the sky. That was what this was. Now, the third case, this, um, this amoeba-shaped cloud, motionless over a city in a high wind, slowly changing its shape. It was a weird thing. It, it really sort of gave me creeps. I had to get a pair of binoculars to find out what it was. And there was a chemical plant of some kind with a high chimney, which I couldn't see, and something, some fumes, I don't know what they were, were coming out of this chimney. You couldn't see them when they left the chimney, as you can't see the smoke, as you often can't see the steam from a kettle. And it was obviously condensing a little way downwind of the chimney and then being dispersed. So it was roughly motionless in space, despite the wind, and it was cha or slowly changing its shape. It was an artificial cloud, a byproduct of this chemical factory. Well, all these three cases are just examples of some of the extraordinary things that I myself have seen in a few years in the sky. And this is why I don't take... I don't take seriously any report of anything seen in the sky. I'm sure that people see these things, but they can't interpret them. Uh, Arthur, you mentioned uh, UFOs and flying saucers. You believe in UFOs and you don't believe in flying saucers. Isn't it possible that because you have never seen a flying saucer, or at least to your knowledge, you don't know that you saw an interplanetary craft, I call them flying saucers because it's convenient on this program. If you've never seen one, and yet you believe in UFOs, 
Isn't it possible for a person to see a flying saucer and not being familiar with its shape or the anything about it that they could be considered to be UFOs? Of course, it's perfectly <clears throat> possible. When there's so many hundreds of explanations of strange things, why on earth bring in an unearthly explanation and to exhausted all the terrestrial ones? Uh, we've talked on this program to a few members of an organization that's called CSI, that's Civilian Saucer Intelligence. It's located in the city of New York. And I might say that the few people that I've had the pleasure of meeting who are members of that organization are certainly brilliant, intelligent people, people that have excellent educational backgrounds, people like Lex Mebbin, Ted Blocher, Ivan Sanderson, these main names may mean nothing to you at all, sir. Oh, you know Ivan. Uh, I heard recently, not from these gentlemen, but from other people, and so far no one has denied it, that a few of these people, not all of the names that I've mentioned, but a few of them, believe in little men, not green ones now, in other words, actually, it's been thrown out on this program by somebody that these men believe in little green men. Now, that has been corrected, not by Mr. Mebbin or Mr. Blocher, but we've had people who said it isn't green one. They don't even know what the colors may be. But due to extensive research on the part of one or two members of civilian saucer intelligence, these people now sort of lean in the direction of the little men visiting this planet. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's nonsense. I mean, there's no evidence for these things, and why bring them in until you've explained, until you've eliminated all the other possibilities? Mm-hmm. Court? I don't think that... You're, uh, you're almost speechless at this moment. Oh, oh no, I'm not. I'm just waiting patiently. Oh, uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I've been monopolizing. Not at all. No, no. Arthur, this, this, this program here, you're liable to go for an hour without stopping. That's the way we work this program. Go Frankly, ahead. Frankly, I think please. Mr. Clark is to be complimented on his uh, examining into the what he saw. I agree with you. I am all for that. I think there is too little of it. We need more of it. But I don't think that what your experience, Mr. Clark, is any indication of the grand total. I have seen things, too, which looked like saucers. I, I didn't think so, I, but I wasn't sure. But in a few minutes, I determined very definitely that there have to be much more solidity to what I saw to prove to me that they were saucers. And I have never seen one yet. Uh, as far as the little men go, uh, I'm sure Ivan Sanderson uh, feels quite convinced in his own mind after having gone down to the... Uh, uh, Oh, wherever that blooming place was, where, there, where the landing was supposed to have been. Are you talking about the West Virginia monster? Well, he went down that Flatwoods, yes. West yes, Virginia. Flatwoods, yeah. uh, West Virginia. Yeah, but that wasn't that the wasn't little, a little that man. That wasn't story. the little man. No, no. I was just trying to think of the location, but uh, I don't feel so bad, Long John, as long as your memory, which is as long as an elephant, <laughs> can't remember where it was. I don't I feel so bad. Yeah. I may have made a mistake here. Ivan Sanderson is not Hans to Hans in the... No, not Hans. No, no, oh, no. 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 Sorry, I'm Ivan mistaken. Sanderson is hmm. the zoologist. Oh, I don't know. Hans either. Stephen Sanderson That's is the right. editorial director of Fantastic... Yes, I know Hans quite well. Oh, Ivan is a, a very bright chap and very well grounded. And I heard him uh, give a dissertation one evening on these little men. As far as I'm concerned, I put it aside because I don't know whether there are or not. I certainly would credit Ivan's intelligence quite considerably because when he goes after something, uh, he's a bit skeptical on these things. Uh, let's say he's very skeptical <clears throat> about them. However, uh, what I wanted to get back to is to some of these... If the, the, Mr. Clark feels that there are no uh, saucers which have been around lately, I would like to just bring out a whole battery of instances here, not uh, consecutively, because after all, that would be taking too much time. But on November 3rd, I presume you're aware, Mr. Clark, that there were quite a concentration of sightings. They started, actually, on November 2nd. Uh... 
On November 2nd, the owner of station KCLV in New Mexico saw a strange glowing object speeding southeast. Now, he could have been mistaken, no question. But the Ground Observer Corps at Midland, Texas, logged reports of a large bluish object, object flying west at a low altitude. And that same evening, Civilian Aeronautics Association, is that correct, Wayne? You're up on that CAA? Tower operators on duty at the Amarillo Airport base sighted a peculiar bluish object moving through the sky. And one of the tower operators, whose business it is to know these things, said he had never seen anything so spectacular. Well, that's another one. Now, however, we get to the things that are going to be more concrete and where we can really sink some teeth in. At 1.30 on November 3rd, on a Sunday, a huge oval-shaped object was reported as landing or very closely approaching trucks on a highway in Leveland, Texas, or right outside of Leveland, Texas. Now, the sheriff uh, investigated these cases, and in three of them, the close passage of the UFO had stopped the car engines and dimmed or put out the headlights. Now, two other men, Clem and uh, Clem himself, the sheriff, and his deputy sheriff, saw the glow from the object themselves as it crossed above the highway and brilliantly lighted up the pavement. And this light was seen by two other patrolmen, each following in a separate car. Now, would you care to comment on that before I go to into some others? Yes. They saw the object as 125 to 200 feet in diameter, I might add. Well, now, this falls down to a number of separate categories. First of all, the sightings, the objects seen in the sky, uh, I, those are quite different from what I was talking about in flying saucers and vehicles. They're what I call the UFOs, and many of those may be an unexplained UFO. I'd like to come back to that later. But before... Um, let me recapitulate. The anything strange seen in the sky, not so not close enough to get you to give an idea of its structure, uh, that may have many hundreds of separate separate explanations, and I think there may be a, res, a residue which has no explanation yet. We, you can call this a genuine UFO, which may turn out to be a, quite a new phenomenon. I have some ideas on that I'd like to come to later. But now, as for the reports of things that land and come come down to earth, people see things coming out of them. I just do not believe any of those. And this one contains, this one you have just quoted, uh, contains the seeds of its own disproof, the story of the car engine stopping, because this brings me right back to 1937. In 1937, 1938, car engines were stopping all over England. They were stopping near the big towers that were being put up along the east coast because those towers were supposed to contain a ray, to generate a ray, which would stop the engines of the, of the Luftwaffe when they bombed England. And this report, every week you were hearing about car engines being stopped. Everybody believed this, quite genuinely, that car engines were being stopped. This was absolute nonsense. They were radar stations, and the car engine reports were being put out by counterintelligence to make people think that this is what these stations really were, that they were to stop the Luftwaffe's engines. There was no truth whatsoever in these reports, but this was a universal belief. So whenever I hear about car engines stopping, I remember the same thing 20 years ago, and there was not a word of truth in it. Well, do you feel then that it's possible that our government are putting out these false rumors? There's no need to make false rumors. Put them, no need to put them out. Well, these uh, had nothing to do with uh, radar towers, Mr. Clark. No, but this is a beautiful example of the sort of hysteria that generates. Someone starts the story, and quite possibly someone sees something and they stole their engine. And then that starts the whole thing. And then they put out the headlights, too. Sure. They probably, they probably pulled the ignition out. Well, we'll have to go to another one where there are a great many more cars involved. Well, before we do that, let me take a moment to do a little piece of business. I think you wanted to get into a little different line. Yeah, I was, uh, now that we proved that flying saucers don't exist, I thought, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh one point, Arthur, in your lecture the other night at the New York Center, you said something about satellites. You said quite a lot about satellites, for that matter. But one thing was, I recall you saying that if the Russians on their satellite had used 
instead of the uh, on the second satellite, instead of the big dog bearing thing, yeah. if they had put a fourth stage on there, yes, they could have hit the moon. Is that uh... yes? They could have land. They could have hit the moon with a payload of about fifty pounds, maybe a hundred pounds. Was, uh, why would they? Having got one satellite up already, I don't know whether the second one was really for scientific research or what, but it certainly would have been a great deal more impressive if they had done a magnesium flare or whatever they're going to do to mark the moon. Well, what they did with Sputnik 2 was much more useful scientifically. That was loaded with instruments, and uh, of course, as well as a dog, and they obtained a vast amount of scientific information from that flight. So that was the obvious next one to do after Sputnik 1, to do the, he- the heavier payload in the orbit. I would say the logical thing now for the next uh, one is an attempt to shoot something around the moon. They can do it any time they feel like it. In fact, I'm rather surprised they haven't already. What value would it be for any country to be able to land on the moon? What value would it to land on, the, on America? The moon is much bigger than America. And after all, the moon is only the stepping stone to the other planets and, and to the universe as a whole. Well, do you think it would be of any value to us in the event of war as a nation? No, I don't think so. We can destroy ourselves completely adequately with existing weapons on this planet. There's no need to go into space to set up military bases. I agree with Mr. Clark. First time this evening. It's a pleasure, sir. <laughs> if we want to use the, the, the moon for any military purpose, I su- suggest we build our air raid shelters there. What? Uh... I want to get back to this other little uh, corroborating instance, because I frankly, uh, Mr. Clark, with due deference to your scientific knowledge, which is vastly in in excess of mine, I wanted to point out another sighting, however, of a UFO by a research engineer of the Air Force Missile Development Center near Alamo at about that same time. What date was that again? Uh, this was on November um, 4th, the following day. Last November. Yes, this past November. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stokes, this research engineer, had seen a huge elliptically shaped object which appeared between the center and White Sands. As it passed near the highway he was on, it had cut out his radio, stopped his engine, and those of ten other cars. Now, Stokes estimated this UFO at about 500 foot diameter, which is a pretty big ship. And he said as it went by at its lowest point, he could feel a wave of heat. Now, how would you explain this? The same way? Nervous foot? Well, now, in these cases, you're helpless until you can go there and interrogate the people. You have to, you have to rely on your sources of information. I don't know what the source is in this case. I have to rely on the fact that whenever this happens, the Air Force sends its officers there to interrogate people. And they've spent, I guess, millions of dollars by now interrogating everyone who's claimed to have seen anything like this. And I I think any reasonable person has to accept the statements of the administration through the Air Force that after analyzing all these cases, they don't believe there are any extraterrestrial phenomena involved. This is all one. If one doesn't accept this explanation, uh, then one has to assume that the Air Force is committing perjury. Or just flipping the pages looking for now, the let, again. Yes. Now, I know the Air Force has made a complete hash of the flying saucer investigation in the early days because, it, because they didn't know what was going on and they, they, went every, they went every which way. But I think that now the matter has been resolved. Major Aho. Uh, regarding this uh, discussion of, uh, of military personnel and what the uh, what the Air Force is doing is doing, etc., uh, I am aware that there are a number of things um, about this uh, New Mexico um, uh, situation that have not uh, come altogether to light. Uh, but I am also aware that uh, in the military service, uh, it makes a great deal of difference whether you're on active duty or whether you're retired. And um, uh, I am aware, and uh, many others are aware, that um, such people as uh, Rear Admiral Farney, retired, uh, who was former guided missiles chief of the Navy, uh, upon retirement made a public statement that flying saucers are real, that these, uh, these UFOs are real, and that he doesn't know where they're coming from except that they're coming from out in space. 
When you say they're real, in other words, you mean they are interplanetary? Not necessarily interplanetary, but that, uh, I think that he meant by that that they are real objects, that they are, uh, he's, he mentioned in this public release that they are controlled objects, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, it, uh, there is a, an indication of a great technology involved, and it must have taken a, a long time to develop this technology. And uh, by that statement, uh, I, I felt that he was implying that uh, uh, there was definitely life and intelligence involved and possibly coming from other people. Oh, planets. in other words, you feel that he implied this? Yes. He didn't actually make this... What, did he actually make the statement that the flying saucers are real? Yes. Is this his that's statement? Why, that's that's they were controlled, which is even more important. I have his statement right here. Just as it happened. Can you give us... Yes. It's a very say. sharp one. Please. Reliable. No, oh, this is a lot of stuff. All right. Reliable reports indicate that there are objects coming into our atmosphere at very high speeds. The way they change position in formation would indicate that their motion is directed. As long as they continue to navigate through the Earth's atmosphere, there is an urgent need to know the facts. Who's uh, I missed that? Admiral no, Delmar S. Farney, oh. U.S. Navy, retired. I, I, would, uh, I would agree with everything in that statement. I think that is a simple what did statement he say? of fact. What did he say? That objects are entering space yeah. from the atmosphere and that they are directed. Yes, and we want to know what they are. <coughs> he said yeah. more than that. <clears throat> On a nationwide uh, news release, uh, January 7, 1957, uh, he said uh, that the, there was a definite high technology involved and it must have taken a long time to develop and that these objects were definitely controlled. Uh, now, if we uh, were relying on the statement of one uh, retired admiral uh, who had a very responsible position in the military service... What did uh, he do? <coughs> uh, he was you former guided missiles chief of the Navy. Oh, I, see. I, think I hope that. that's a responsible position. Yes. yes. Uh, another uh, uh, person uh, upon retirement from the uh, military service uh, Vice Admiral Hillencooter, former director of Central Intelligence, and certainly here is a man that should know. Uh, uh, if we um, uh, if we consider uh, intelligence, um, uh, Central Intelligence as being an important agency, why? And I think we do uh, concede that it is an important agency in the American uh, military, set up in the American government. Uh, why did Vice Admiral Hillencooter? become a director of uh, the NICAP, uh, the organization that uh, Major Donald Kehoe directs in Washington, D.C. Why did he Is that a one question? Do <coughs> yeah. you know the answer to it? Well, I, I feel that I do. Uh, Would you he, want also, to give us the he also has made a statement that uh, these objects are real and that the American public uh, should be informed about it. You know, one thing, Major Aho. This may be a very stupid question, and when you do this seven nights during the week, you're bound to hit a few stupid ones. Do you believe in some of the contact stories? And I'm not going to ask you which ones now. Uh, well, uh, let's put it uh, uh, this way, John. It's, um, uh, it's very uh, difficult for me to uh, put myself in a position to say, well, I will support this one, or I will... No, I don't. I'm not going to ask you that. This is not a trick question. Yes. Do you believe that... Flying saucers with Venusians or Martians have landed someplace in the States here and that some of the citizens of the United States have spoken to these people and even possibly have had a ride in the saucer. Uh, I, would, uh, I would like to summarize, this, uh, summarize the, uh, the situation in this manner, uh, that all through history... Uh, mankind has been very, very stubborn about accepting any kind of change or any new idea. I don't care what it is. Uh, there was a time when, uh, uh, when it was believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and uh, that the Earth was the center of the solar system. And uh, every time uh, that a scientist or astronomer, whoever it was, um, came out with a new idea, he was met by ridicule and opposition from uh, all directions. Is this a new idea? No, it's <clears> a, <throat> a little bit different than, than, than an no. astronomer, somebody coming up with a new idea. This is a man who, who, uh, who the, the following day contacts his neighbors, and he says, Joe, last night a saucer landed in the backyard 
and a couple of Venusians came in and uh, broke bread with me. Uh, we have a lot more to go on uh, than that. Uh, the, uh, more than that? We have much to go? more to, mm-hmm. to go on than that. Uh, we have a situation today where there are thousands of these sighting reports coming from all over the world. And uh, many, uh, by astronomers, I have before me a, um, a Mr. Uh, Mr. record uh, by... Uh, Major Aho, pardon me, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I wonder if you could answer that question a moment. Because I, we're going to be here for a long while, but I'd, I'd just like to have an answer to that question. Should I repeat it? No, I, I know what your question is. Uh, but I would like to include uh, with the possibility that contacts have been established. Well, it's, um, it's, it's strictly a possibility. It isn't a fact in your mind. No, is it's a definite possibility. It's a possibility and, in mind. I think it's a possibility in any intelligent yeah. man's mm-hmm. mind. And uh, the fact that we have had thousands of sighting uh, reports coming in from all over the world, mm-hmm. and uh, these statements that these objects are intelligently controlled, mm-hmm. and uh, the statement that uh, Mr. Clark made that uh, uh, there's, uh, in his belief, that we may have been visited before, uh, then I don't think that we should uh, just cancel this thing out and say that um, uh, for some reason, without any definite um, uh, logic or investigation, we have to cancel out these sighting reports. I think that they are a part of the evidence. And uh, when you begin to put the whole picture together, uh, the thousands of sighting reports, the radar reports, the photographs uh, that have been taken, and there are hundreds of photographs available uh, in color, in moving pictures, and I would say that the military services of the world have uh, thousands, running perhaps into the hundreds of thousands of photographs. Uh, if we put all of this together, and then we put these contact stories together and examine them, examine the witnesses, uh, the report they witnessed these contacts taking place, mm-hmm. uh, we may have an intelligent um, uh, program, something to go by. Major Aho, there's only one brief comment I'd like to make. And that is, it would seem to me that if our government had as much knowledge about this thing, about these things, as we seem to have around this table here <laughs> seven nights during the week. I don't know what they're fooling around at Cape Canaveral tonight, down in Florida, when it would be just a matter, I, I would rather stall a little while and say, well, look, maybe we can schmooze with one of these Venusians <laughs> or Martians. Maybe it'll be next week, maybe it'll be a month from now, and uh, we'll make a deal, and we'll get, you know, the in inside and it'll make Sputnik look like, like a large nothing. Yeah, I, I think uh, M- Major has really proved my point beautifully. Um, if there are thousands of reports of contacts, that proves practically conclusively that contacts do not occur. If there are only two or three reports of contacts, those might be real. But if thousands of people report them and, nothing, and they're never proved, that proves that whatever they are reporting has some other explanation. You I see don't my think argument? that goes by at all, though, Mr. Clark, because all of, during the Middle Ages, the peasants were reporting meteors. And they're reporting witches, too. They're reporting meteors. These are actual physical things. Yes, and, no, don't uh, confuse the issue, though. And don't confuse the UFOs and the landing of soldiers. I was citing your, your reasoning there. As I don't think that's conclusive at all. No, you haven't got my... You, I'm afraid you've mis- misunderstood me. Well, if you report, report seeing things and meet... And I'm reporting... I'm referring to contacts, reports of contacts... Now, contacts are such, if they exist, are so extraordinary and so important that if, if a, even a few of them occur, that will very quickly be settled positively without any doubt whatsoever. I could believe, if a few people reported actual contacts, just a few people, I might believe them. But when thousands of people report contacts, yet this is not conclusively proved, then it cannot be happening. Uh, I have a uh, question along that line that... Um uh, I've weighed in my uh, mind many times when I get into a discussion with people say, well, uh, these, certain, uh, these uh, certain stories or certain stories just can't possibly be true, that they're too fantastic, etc. Uh, I would uh, like to ask the question, uh, Mr. Clark, that if you had a contact uh, with a spaceship, how would you convince the people of the world uh, that this contact was real, that this, uh, you had really had this contact. This is an excellent question. I'm glad he asked. I'm glad you asked that, Senator. Uh, I've often thought about this. Uh, now, first of all, I'm a photographer, and uh, I'm relentless in the photographic evidence. 
uh, one of the first things I would do, of course, is to shoot off any number of rolls of film. Providing... If I had a the, camera the, with me. And, no, and providing that the Venusians or the Martians would permit this. Well, now, there's no reason why they shouldn't. I would, I would just walk and refuse to have anything to do with them if they wouldn't permit it. You would really? Well, I, I admit I might succumb to temptation. <laughs> <laughs> no picture, no laundry, Mac. I know. Right. But um, uh, I would try and hang on to them somehow and try and get a picture of them. You would sneak uh, it out with your buttonhole camera. Yeah, right. Very good. Well, they might be. They might blank the film with with the radiation. Well, why from their should they do this? Though. I mean, the point is, un, un, you know, unconsciously. I mean, you know. It's... I would like to. If I hope that you gentlemen don't mind this suggestion, but I'd uh, like to uh, take a, uh, a few minutes with Mister Clark, and I think that uh, the rest of you gentlemen should be will possibly be interested in this too about the making of a moon. I thought possibly you could give us some of the information, Mr. Clark. I know that that is the uh, subject that you are lecturing on, and very frankly, we're not trying to blow the entire lecture here <laughs> by any means. But I'd like to have uh, some information about that. Possibly you can tell us some things. Well, that was the, uh, it was first of all the title of my book on the satellite program, mm -hmm. uh, which has just been revised and, and reissued in Santa the post Sputnik editions out now. And it is also the title of my lecture program. I had Who's to give publisher? The Harpers. They publish all my uh, non-fiction, my underwater books, as well as my space books. Well, in that, I've traced the history of the idea of satellites. And incidentally, it seems that the first man ever to conceive of a satellite was a New Englander, a Boston man, Edward Everett Hale, who wrote a book in the 1870s called The Brick Moon. And uh, some of Hale's ideas were surprisingly modern and up-to-date. And I've traced it from, from that up to the uh, current epoch, the interest in satellites as research vehicles, uh, culminating now, of course, in their launching by the USSR and by mm -hmm. the United States. How do you uh, compare uh, our satellite with that of uh, Russia's? Well, of course, there's no doubt about it. The Russian satellite is technically a, a far superior achievement. I mean, it is a tremendous... Talking about number one or number, uh, number two. two? Well, number, number two. one, of course, is still... Even there. number one yes. is superior. Yes. Mm -hmm. Though, in a year or so, we should be able to do the same thing as the Russians have done. But then, of course, what the Russians have done in a year is another matter to gain. Mm -hmm. Charles? Arthur, there's one thing about Central Effect. There are several questions. Immediately, satellites are brought up. In fact, when the first Sputnik started swooping overhead, people were saying, and a few that I managed to get in contact with at the time, thought, oh my, there's this big Russian satellite zooming over New York City, mm -hmm. and who knows, maybe at any moment it will drop a bomb or something, you know, we are in great danger. And I, uh, perhaps in ignorance, said, hoping to clear this up, that if they did drop a bomb, it wouldn't do them much good because it would burn up before it got here. Now, am I right or wrong on that? If, if a satellite, suppose we had... They had loaded Sputnik 2 instead of with a dog. They had put maybe a little atomic warhead in there and figured out, uh, you know, three times around back to press the trigger so yeah. it would hit New York City. Would it ever get here? Sure, if, they, if they've solved the reentry problem, and there's no little doubt they have, we've solved it. Uh, the problem of preventing the thing burning up, there are several ways of doing that. You have a specially shaped nose or sort of rounded blunt <laughs> nose, which diverts the heat away from the... Uh, warhead itself, and you also have uh, ceramic heat insulating materials, and uh, in these various ways you can get your payload back into the atmosphere. In other words, uh, a satellite could be used for war-making purposes. It could drop bombs. Seems an awful complicated the, the, the way word, to go about it. The word drop is rather misleading. I mean, if, uh -huh. you, if you don't drop a thing from the satellite, you have to bring it down its files into the atmosphere. The drop may take you right around the world, perhaps a couple of times. But the, the existence of Sputnik 2 is proof that they can land uh, a warhead anywhere they like on the surface of the Earth. I don't mm -hmm. know what accuracy, and they probably don't know, but they can they can get it down within, say, 10, 20 miles anywhere they like on Earth. Well, this Sputnik mm -hmm. is not outside of the Earth's gravitational field, oh, is it? Completely? Oh, no. In other words, it still maintains the orbit there. Oh, quite. Correct? I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing is outside the Earth's gravitational field, and up where Sputnik uh, 2 is... 
Earth's gravity is uh, still about oh, 90% as powerful as it is here at Earth's at sea level. I mean, it's Earth's gravity that keeps it in orbit. If it wasn't for gravity, it would just shoot out into space. That's right, yeah. There's another question out there. I also hear in the war-making aspects of satellites, uh, everyone, or not everyone, but people seem to be worried about violating air sovereignty and so forth, particularly with the fact that satellites may be going over as observation uh, vehicles. Yeah. Not observation of space conditions, but observation of Comments. ground conditions. And I wonder how much observation you could do at 18,000 miles an hour. Well, the speed doesn't matter because uh, I have seen photographs taken from jet planes traveling at 600 miles an hour at, uh, at uh, treetop level that were pin sharp. So the speed is no, the speed doesn't affect it at all. Uh, the trouble is the uh, the atmosphere and then clouds and that kind of thing. But uh, there's no doubt that you could put reconnaissance equipment, long-range cameras, in a satellite which could give you invaluable information, particularly about the movement of, uh, of surface vessels, for example. On the uh, ocean movement. On the ocean, yes, yes, they could spot all ocean movements, except when there was cloud cover. There was one thing, uh, speaking of warlike satellites, you didn't mention any of these points, but there was one point that intrigued me considerably in the lecture when you talked about the shrapnel technique. Mm, yes, uh, one, up a satellite. Yeah, this, would you explain that again? That was quite fascinating. Well, um, there have been a lot of suggestions that we might build, or somebody might build, space fortresses which could be used to dominate the Earth and perhaps as launching platforms uh, to threaten the world. But I think that if such fortresses were built, they could be destroyed so very much more easily than they could be constructed that they would be worthless militarily. And the, re the way you could destroy them easily is this. Uh, you, the satellite, of course, the space water has a fixed orbit, and you know just where it is at any moment. Just going round and round, it'd be a spectacularly visible object in the sky, even to the naked eye, much brighter than Sputnik 2, to be the brightest thing in the sky. If you want to destroy it, all you do is you shoot up into the same orbit, but in the opposite direction. A uh, warhead loaded with old-fashioned shrapnel. And somewhere as it goes around the orbit, even it could be on the other side of the Earth from the space fort, you explode this warhead and the shrapnel scatters. It uses quite a small charge of explosive. And it forms an, a cloud of particles, a cloud of shot, if you like, which will then meet the space fortress head-on twice every revolution, in other words, about every 45 minutes or so, at a total combined speed of about 30,000 miles an hour, say 10 times as fast as a rifle bullet. So if, it miss, if, miss, if you miss the first time, you, 45 minutes later, you, you have another go at it. And every 45 minutes, the space water sails through this cloud of shrapnel. Or and the cloud of shrapnel through it, as a matter of fact. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I wish we were half as ingenious at uh, <clears throat> prolonging life and doing something for mankind. Yeah, I quite agree with you. To and I hope, incidentally, that the space stations may help us to prolong life. There's some good evidence for thinking that under low gravity conditions, and of course in a space station you have zero gravity, that uh, men might live longer. And certainly that uh, men suffering from various, perhaps heart diseases and muscular diseases, might live normal lives. And I think <clears throat> that the medical results of building space stations may be quite important. Uh, I skipped the point. Didn't you say before that the Earth's gravity was just as strong <laughs> out there as it is down here? If uh, so, how do I it's, it's a little weaker. It's, it's, it's still about 90%. It falls off a distance, but very slowly. So at the distances of the present satellites, it's still quite strong. For instance, you have to go out uh, 4,000 miles before it falls to a quarter of its sea level value here. Yeah, well, you were planning on a, uh, or at least conjecturing, a space station considerably farther out than that, then, where you, well, where you could, uh, could be benefited. Oh, and, ah, well, that's another thing. Uh, in a space vehicle at any distance from the Earth, there is no feeling of gravity. You're under the pull of gravity, but you don't feel it because you are falling freely. Now, look, this is a difficult conception, but here, right here on the Earth's surface, you can be weightless, you can have no sensation of gravity. If you're in an elevator and the lift and, and the cable breaks, you're fully under the influence of gravity, but you're weightless as long as you're falling, you see. Yeah, you don't stay weightless for yeah. long. <laughs> sure. True but in a space station, even if it's only even if it's only a couple of hundred miles up, where gravity is very nearly the same as it is here, the, the total force of gravity, you would feel weightless because you are falling freely all the time around the Earth. So you've got to, you have to distinguish between these two facts. 
that you can have this weightlessness or so-called gravityless feeling even when gravity is there. Why would this be beneficial to our health, or at least possibly be beneficial? Well, think of all the work we do against gravity here on the Earth's surface, moving our bodies around, climbing upstairs, and uh, this must definitely shorten our lives to some extent. But what would happen if we had no gravitational pull? Well, if we'd would I, would, wouldn't I be floating? You would, float, you, would, you would float around, and you would... not how would I control myself, though? In other words, I don't want to go upstairs. I want to stay right here. Okay, well, I'm afraid you have to have belts, but you have to have seat straps if you want to sit down in one place. But you remember, we can build space stations so you can have gravity in one part or a sort of artificial gravity in one part and no gravity in another part. It's a very simple trick. All you do is you design your space station like a big wheel and it rotates slowly. And if you adjust the rate of rotation, you can have things so that centrifugal force gives you a normal feeling of gravity at the rim of the wheel and as you go towards the hub, the center of the wheel, you have no gravity, so you just what would happen to all are. of the uh, objects that we may have, uh, like on a table here, the uh, packages of cigarettes the uh, the microphones and things, wouldn't these be floating in the air or no, would you, they go right to the ceiling you have those things in the section of the space station where there's gravity, you have mm -hmm. them on the rim of the space station, that's where mm -hmm. you, you do your cooking and you you have your showers and, you, and you, you prepare your meals and you sit down, and things are perfectly normal there, but when you go towards the center of the space station your apparent weight, because you're no longer rotating so quickly your apparent weight falls off and at the center of the station you now have no weight. When we come to the hub, the hub we would start to float? You would float around in the hub. That's right. Well, well, if we were in a room then, would I be on the ceiling? There is no ceiling. Everything. In a room there wouldn't be a ceiling? There, there are just six walls. There's no up or down. There's no preferred direction. In, in the hub of the space station, oh. there's no gravity. There's no up or down. There are just six walls around you. Well, what would be the purpose of walking into this hub. Well, you couldn't walk there, actually. You'd, you'd just you'd drift. It'd be like, under, drift it's like underwater. And one reason why I'm interested in underwater exploring and spend most of my time there is this is the nearest thing you can get to the gravity-free condition of a space station. Yes, but uh, would you want to live underwater? This wouldn't be comfortable, would it? I'm only very happy underwater. <laughs> <laughs> you you came to the right program, uh, right, honestly. Right. <laughs> Arthur, there's one... Uh, one question I would like to get in, I have read, it may have been even one of your books, I don't know, uh, not only the various weightless this phenomena, but the fact that in a weightless condition of free fall, uh, a number of curious things happens, among which, as I recall, is the fact that unless you're very careful, if you're in a weightless condition, you might suffocate in your own breath. Now, what, what is the oh, function oh, there? Yes, so the point is that the, when we breathe out, we, the, the air is heated and it rises away from us normally here on Earth. But in a space station, it, it couldn't rise because uh, there'd be no gravity. But this is no problem. You simply have to have a very slight amount of forced ventilation. You have to have fans to keep the air changing around anyway. So there's no, there's no real danger of suffocating because your exhaled air wouldn't drift away from you. Quite. Well, now, if you um, don't have to exert any effort, what about our muscles? Would they not atrophy, possibly? This could be a danger, but um, you might have to take a certain amount of exercise to overcome this. But I'm thinking of specifically of people who have muscular defects and can't get around, and perhaps even multiple amputees, for instance, might be, much, might be able to operate, <coughs> at least men who've lost their legs, they might be able to operate perhaps even better under these conditions than normal men could because they wouldn't have so much useless weight to drag around. Well, why? Um, oh, excuse me, Major. Major? Uh, I'd like to uh, make a comment on this uh, gravity um, situation. We always talk about um, about opposing gravity or blasting off into space or neutralizing gravity or um, uh, the power of the, uh, the motor and the energy that is needed to... Uh, uh, establish these space stations and, uh, and put satellites into orbit, etc. And um, uh, man has, uh, at various times, uh, found that it's uh, very helpful to work with the forces of nature. Uh, do you think that there is a possibility that we can learn how to use gravity for power and uh, rather than oppose it, uh, use it like we use water power, you might say, as an energy? Well, I don't see how you can use gravity and get power out of gravity. 
But I, I think we may one day be able to control gravity in some way or neutralize it, but we shall need power to do it. For instance, if you consider the problem of getting away from the Earth, there's a certain amount of power, a certain amount of energy required for the job, and it doesn't matter how you do it, whether you go by rocket or any other conceivable device, there's a minimum amount of, of energy needed for the job. This is, if you climb over a mountain, if you travel over a mountain, doesn't you have to have a, do a certain amount of work whether you walk, whether you travel by bicycle or automobile or airplane. A, and one day we may be able to control gravity and go away from the Earth much more comfortably and with less of flame and fury than at present. But we shall soon need a source of power, perhaps of nuclear energy or something like that. Arthur, I wonder if you put any credence talking about controlling gravity. Do you know about the experiments of Roger Babson? Is he still doing them? Or do you know the about Gravity Research Foundation? Yeah. Well, I don't uh, know if he's ever done any experiments. He's set up a fund, didn't he, to collect material on gravity. And well, as I understand, he had offered a prize for anyone who, uh, quite a substantial prize yes. for anyone who could find an anti-gravitic substance. And that, in fact, at his uh, research center against gravity, I guess you might call it, mm. they were doing a fairly methodical technique of sort of suspending things in the air and holding various substances under in the hope that, you know, like maybe you'd hold a plate of fried eggs under and who knows, maybe it just wouldn't fall that time and you have it. Well, there's a lot of work going on uh, in various research laboratories to see if we can find anything about gravity. But you, you, an anti-gravitic substance of the type that, for instance, Wells had in his uh, story, The First Man in the Moon, so a gravity shield, it's quite easy to show that is impossible. It violates the law of the conservation of energy. On the other hand, it's theoretically perfectly possible to have a substance which has negative gravity. In other words, it goes up. It, it's repelled by ordinary matter. That's a different thing altogether. That <clears throat> might be theoretically possible. But a gravity shield is not possible unless it is powered by an external power source. When you speak of the uh, matter with negative gravity, this gets into science fictional concepts. Well, but wouldn't this... Uh, as I recall, the definition of this sort of stuff, this would be negative matter, as a matter of fact. It, it, might, be. it, it might be. And if it got together with positive matter, isn't the theory that it would be a big boom? Yeah. That's right. It yeah. wouldn't be too handy to have this stuff around. It might not be useful. <laughs> I don't know. It wouldn't uh, render the uh, jointure inert, would it? Uh, well, if, if this negative matter met ordinary matter, each would annihilate the other, and the result would make an, a hydrogen bomb seem a very modest performance. Uh, I've had... Uh, had something uh, working around and around in the uh, the uh, back of my head here for uh, the last 30 minutes or so, and uh, I must insist to get this out uh, while Mr. Clark is here. Um, the uh, we've had quite a bit of this discussion about uh, about the Earth, uh, the the danger of uh, uh, mankind completely wiping himself out on this planet before he becomes intelligent enough to control the things he has created. Uh, also, we have uh, looked back into history and uh, we have um, uh, thought about uh, various things that have happened in the past. And uh, the history of the world is not a very beautiful one. It uh, seems like we have had uh, war upon war as uh, long as um, our, we have a, a record of history. And it seems that, um, that many people from uh, time to time have uh, risen to positions of leadership uh, leading various nations or countries uh, either as uh, dictators or kings, and uh, down through history we have said later that uh, those men were insane because they plunged their nation and they plunged the, war, the world into war at various times. Uh, we have discussed um, uh, these various uh, persons who um, uh, claim that they have had uh, uh, contacts uh, with spaceships, and uh, we have um, cast around some ideas as to uh, who is sane and who is not sane. And as I look around me um, uh, on the uh, Earth and uh, think about these things and think about our nuclear program and uh, our present ideas that we uh, about our next um, uh, step with the uh, nuclear bombs is to blast a bomb off into space, explode them out 50 miles out, or perhaps one on the moon, and blow bits, uh, hunks off the moon and hope that they will float back to Earth so we can examine them and uh, things of that nature, and um, uh, something that uh, George uh, Bernard Shaw uh, said comes to mind. He said that the Earth is the lunatic asylum of the solar system, 
And I just wonder if perhaps uh, maybe this might be true, that uh, most of Earth people are actually lunatics, and uh, that perhaps uh, the Earth might be off limits uh, to um, people from other planets, and that that's why uh, perhaps they don't um, uh, land in the middle of a populated area or contact uh, the president or contact some king or emperor uh, because maybe the uh, the Earth people are in just in a, such a state of uh, development that they're not safe to contact. Charles? I wonder what, to get in this, uh, I may say that Mr. Clark is a unique authority on the ideas of George Bernard Shaw because I happen to have seen some correspondence from Mr. Shaw to Mr. Clark. And it's, as I recall, Arthur, there were some uh, rather peculiar ideas in this correspondence, weren't there, that Mr. Shaw was putting forth about uh, gravity and vacuum and rocket experiments? Well, before you answer that question, Mr. Clark, let me just tell our listeners again that this is WOR Radio, your station in New York, and this is Long John with the party line. First, could I make a slight correction, John? You said that Harper has published my books. Well, they publish all my nonfiction, but I have a large number of other publishers who may be a little... Er, oh, well, I'm sure. I don't think you made the statement. Oh, no, no. Uh, Harper's, Harper's do my nonfiction, but uh, Gnome Press, Valentine Books, and Harcourt Brace have mm-hmm. done my fiction. Um, as to the points that a major raised, uh, including his very interesting one about the idea that the Earth is a sort of lunatic asylum, I think that's a very plausible theory. And uh, one of my novels, uh, Childhood's End, was, in a sense, based on this idea that... Uh, we are ripe to be taken over and uh, and run properly. However, as far as Shaw is concerned, it's an interesting story. About oh, ten years ago now, when I was still at King's College London, uh, I wrote a paper on space travel and its social effects, and I sent a copy of this to Shaw because I, I quoted the uh, concluding lines, I believe, from um, Back to Methuselah, the last chapter of that, so as far as I, as far as mine can reach, uh, is quite relevant to this subject. And uh, Shaw was quite impressed by this paper and uh, wrote back to me, I still have the correspondence, and promptly joined the Interplanetary Society. And it was quite remarkable that at that age he would be about 92, I think, then. He was still so active-minded that he was interested in this development of space travel. Major, any further comments? Well, I, I'm just uh, inclined to go right along. <laughs> this is perhaps the answer uh, why we don't have one uh, land uh, in the middle of one of our populated cities or contact one of our leaders because um, uh, the destructive forces that we have built here um, enough to destroy um, all of the civilization on this planet. I think that's pretty well agreed. Uh, the question would be, what would we do if we had something further? If we don't learn uh, how to control uh, these things and use uh, our technology for the benefit of society, for the benefit of mankind, rather than for destruction? I've, I've often wondered, uh, Major Ahol, why it is that so many people who believe in saucers are under the impression that the Venusians and the Martians and members, uh, or rather citizens of the planet Clarion, some people are not familiar with that planet. It's behind the moon. Uh, I've often wondered why these people who believe in flying saucers are so sold on the idea that the Venusians and Martians are actually interested in doing us only good. No, I don't. Uh, I don't think that that's a um, uh, general uh, should generally be applied to all people that are interested in the flying saucer subject. Um, I'm uh, rather of the opinion myself that um, if we're going to grow, we're going to have to grow ourselves. And uh, uh, if uh, there might be such a thing that um, uh, from this visitation, uh, this touch-and-go business, uh, touch-and-go landings and, and uh, the, the sightings and so forth, are merely to arouse our curiosity so we will learn that there is something bigger, something greater you in the universe. That, that they're doing, sort of playing a game with us? That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. Showing See, us these that These are adored, intelligent people that are far <laughs> superior to us as far as intelligence is concerned. And, and they're running these things around these saucers just, just to show us, with us? Just to show us that uh, there is something 
uh, that we can investigate uh, and uh, learn about... Is this a display the of love for your fellow man and that sort of thing? No, I think it's a, uh, a display of, uh, of a natural law that if you're going to grow, you're, every person has to make an individual effort. Uh, to do that growing. Are you talking and about individuals now, Major? I'm talking, talking about, about the, nations. I'm talking and about individuals, and from individuals it becomes families, and from families it becomes uh, communities, and from communities, nations, and, and an international community. Right here on this planet, uh, Major Aho, uh, it seems to me that I have heard from time to time that it's been suggested that we should exchange ideas in other words, the, the Russians should give us all of the facts about Sputniks and we should give them all the facts about things that we know. And if we could do this, if we could exchange ideas and, and knowledge that we may have accumulated, we possibly wouldn't have wars. At least I, I've read this someplace I know. If this is true, why is it that these uh, super intellects who are coming around in these saucers just playing games with us, why don't they come down and, and and give us the facts, you know, just say, look, fellas, uh, you, you, the, the whole thing that you're doing here is completely obsolete. These, uh, these little toys that you have, they look like children's kites that you call jet planes and things like that. Uh, well, why don't they help us? Well, perhaps, uh, John, it will come to that point. I think that... Uh, why is the great delay? They... This has been going on for over 2,000 or 4,000, I don't know how many thousands of years. Why is it taking so long before they're going to be kind enough as big brothers to come down and help the stupid people? Well, let's hang the sign right on man's own ignorance. Uh, his inability to uh, examine new things with an open mind. Examine? Uh, what chance do we have to examine, Major Aho? We have the chance every day. I'm examining. Anyone else can do the you're, same You're thing. examining saucers? Yes, absolutely. And the, mean, the, they, the, they, the role they is want... open for anyone that wants to do the same thing. Uh, I know that uh, that many people are making uh, statements about, um, uh, about this subject that have not, have not examined uh, uh, very much of the evidence. And uh, they discarded without any examination, said, well, this is all Tommy Ross. Well, Major Aho, in other words, when you say that they're giving us a chance and they have for the past 2,000 or 5,000 years gave us the opportunity of examining these things, uh, do you mean that they, they've just been flying around and that's the extent of the examination that they permitted us to, to make? In other words, they haven't actually, or are they landing saucers here that I can go over tomorrow afternoon and take a peek at? Uh, I think that it'll, uh, uh, when we begin to understand more of the picture, that it will tie in uh, with the development of the Earth, of a greater technology, the fact that we have become airborne, uh, the fact that we are thinking about going out into space ourselves. Psychologically, now is the time where a man might best understand that there might be life on other planets already. And that uh, he will, when he reaches out into space, he will begin to meet some of that life. But uh, it is obvious to me uh, that the uh, the state of uh, conditions on this planet, uh, that if a uh, one of these ships and uh, a superior technology fell into the hands of any nation on the Earth uh, that is involved in, in this Cold War business, uh, that immediately we would want to make war weapons out of these things. Don't you? And again, it comes me. right down to the same thing that we have greater weapons of destruction. We have greater capabilities of, de of uh, delivering greater uh, destructive uh, uh, power and so forth in warfare. And until a man can overcome warfare, why a lot of these things are just, uh, they're, they're just uh, taken down rather than up. And uh, I think that we have to, to uh, learn to, to uh, control such things as, um, as fear and hate and envy and greed and, and a lot of those things that are uh, are human attributes that we just don't seem to be able to get away from. But I think that we're going to have to very soon uh, get away from these or the civilization is done for. Well, we've been trying for a number of years. I was just wondering this, though. Don't you think it's rather unfortunate that these wonderful people have permitted us to remain ignorant for so many years? No, let's not put it that way. Let's say that we have permitted ourselves to remain ignorant. Let's put the uh, the blame right on the on our home doorstep, because uh, someone else cannot edu educate another person against their will. Uh, it's an individual effort, and uh, it will always be an individual effort. 
Is this, a, this is an interesting point that I've often thought about. Uh, you might argue if these uh, superior beings are around, and um, as I explained, I don't believe they are, but if they were around, they might in fact hold off because if you have made contact too soon with a primitive race, you might destroy the morale and spirit of that race in the way that on this planet various backward uh, races have died out after contact with uh, higher races, uh, or at least higher civilizations. I don't believe there are any higher races on this planet. But um, so they get an inferiority complex, a cultural inferiority complex, and die out. This might conceivably happen if we came up in, came in contact with a very much superior race to our own. That's a rather frightening thing. <clears throat> Incidentally, the question that was raised is if, if this is a lunatic asylum, this Earth, and uh, our our um, our, <laughs> wardens, our wardens are flying around. <laughs> All I want to know is where are the tranquilizers? Good <laughs> work. <laughs> well, I think that uh, there is a point here that's rather interesting. After all, what we are lacking is not perhaps knowledge in physical sciences, material sciences. To me, these things have gone ahead at a tremendous rate, certainly in the last, oh, 30 or 40 or 50 years. Ever since, uh, well, about 50 years ago when the first airplane was uh, successfully gotten off the ground. But our social science, our spiritual science, has not gone far, uh, far ahead, nor has it proceeded rapidly, nor in any measure kept pace with our development of physical and material sciences. In other words, man has not learned how to live with fellow man. Now, John asked, uh, why don't the space people come down to us and tell us? We spent an evening, Saturday evening, here in this studio talking about law and order. This is one of the basic laws of the universe. Uh, I should tell you, you know vastly more about that than I do, Mr. Clark. After all, you studied this. But uh, we must apply that same rule to our own planet here and have the nations of the world live under law and order. In other words, we know much better than we do. And I think this is the problem. Uh, we've, I feel as strongly as uh, Wayne does about we've got to do the job ourselves. We've had many prophets. We've had many great men who have told us a better way to live. These words are very intelligent, but we haven't uh, exerted ourselves sufficiently to live by them. How do you feel about that? I think that's true, and I think that every intelligent race on any planet must eventually come to the point we've reached now. And this point is when they succeed in getting control of sufficient natural forces to destroy themselves. And at this point, a race either does destroy itself or it gets through its adolescence and reaches maturity, and then it's probably safe, at least against uh, internal destruction. And it would be very interesting to know how many races, taking the universe as a whole, succeed in making this dangerous transition. And even more interesting to know if we will make it. Well, you know, this uh, story that Lantus and Lemuria are destroying each other, uh, to me, is not at all impossible nor unlikely. Uh, after all, the uh, extent to which, the speed with which we have developed here in this past half century, and if we keep on at this rate and don't learn to live better, uh, I don't think we're going to see another half century by any manner of means. So for some other civilization prior to this, and perhaps a whole number prior to them, if indeed they existed, that yes, would be likely. Yes, well, I'm thinking of uh, civilizations on, on other on other stars, uh, on other planetary systems. I don't believe there'd be any earlier civilization on this Earth because there would have been some archaeological or geological evidence. And certainly there'd be no technological civilization on this planet before. Certainly no civilization ever waged uh, nuclear war because the evidence of that would be very, very obvious. If there'd ever been, say, nuclear war on this planet, the radioactive byproducts would be all over the place and we would know all about it. Even though it happened some 20 or 30,000 years oh, ago? Oh, even if it happened 10 million years ago. Uh-huh. Of course, you know that we've just discovered that Atlantis never existed. These corings from the Atlantic have settled that, these new uh, deep-sea corings have settled that point quite conclusively now. This yeah. I hadn't heard about. What, uh, what's well, the story about in oceanographic work that's going on all the time. They've got... You got it now? 
give it back. All right, cut it there. Cut the beeper. Just a moment. I'll take it on another call. I wonder if you gentlemen will continue a moment. I want to grab this here. Skipping motion. Uh, earlier, Major Aho, you were talking about a mysterious cave in Egypt. And perhaps I heard you wrong, but as I recall, you said that the reason that they deduced that they must have had atomic power was that they were painting by bright lights. Was that... Uh, was that uh, the statement that you uh, made? The, the general uh, context of this man's uh, statement in this uh, lecture, he covered all of the, covered all, uh, all of the Far East, and uh, various finds, archaeological finds that have been made there, as, and especially in recent years. And uh, he mentioned this one specific item, and I happened to uh, to hear this uh, uh, this lecture. Uh, he stated that they were amazed uh, when they found uh, these paintings within a dark cave. Uh, covering all of the surface area of the pa- of the cave, overhead and all of the sides, everything was painted, and uh, it was a terrific job of painting. And uh, the the colors, everything indicated that there were no shadows, that there had been no shadows in the cave when the when the painting was done. They had to have brilliant light in there uh, in order to uh, do this job of painting. Uh, then, uh, as a result of that, uh, they began to investigate further. And uh, they dug into uh, various areas of the cave floor, and in the immediate center of this cave, uh, they dug and they found the lead down underground. It had been uh, buried, covered over down through the years. Uh, there was a lead uh, foundation right in the center of the cave, a kind of a, uh, um, I don't know the exact shape of it, except that it was lead. And they checked it with Geiger counters, and it was still radioactive. Lead doesn't get radioactive. I mean, the, the ground in that vicinity, uh, right around this lead, uh, was radioactive, according to his statement. Well, all ground is radioactive. Everything is radioactive to some extent. But this is a beautiful example of the way that people will build up <coughs> fantastic accounts of complicated theories, perhaps on the basis of some simple fact. Now, we know there are caves like this in France where the wonderful paintings right right out underground in complete darkness and beautifully colored and they've only been seen properly now we have modern electric lighting mm-hmm. yet we know that the people who made those caves had only primitive forms of lighting they must have mixed their colors out in the open light and for some mystical and magical reason have painted these <coughs> caves down in by the light of perhaps oil lamps or flickering torches and in fact you can see the smoke marks that their torches made there's no mystery about it except why they bothered to do it why would anyone paint in the dark well, <laughs> it's it, something well, actually, you couldn't it's ma- actually it's magic it's, it's part of their part of their religion and part of their fertility rites and uh, all the rest of it but we know how they painted these things they, they said the smoke of the torches is there and the colors are beautiful they could never have seen the colors properly with their torches we can see them with electric light but that doesn't mean to say that they had electric light all I know uh, about this is uh, exactly what I heard, and uh, <clears throat> this man with it was with a uh, uh, with an archaeological uh, uh, survey group that had been working in the Far East for approximately 30 years, and uh, he made the statement. Uh, I have nothing to uh, to verify it or support it. All I know is that he made the statement, and that they did check it, this area with Kaiser counters that was radioactive only in the center of the cave. And more than an arm alert would do. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so highly radioactive. Well, one would have to have an examination by competent scientists with uh, proper equipment, and incidentally, one can think of a lot of ways in which this could easily happen naturally, for instance, uh, assuming that um, there was an extra, really high, extra high layer of radioactivity. This would, this often does happen. For instance, you may have particular salts going through particular... Uh, static tides, which is the one on the top? I can never remember if the static tide or the static mic. The static tide is on the top, I think. Right. right. Well, you, you, have, you, have vein, you have various deposits of, of minerals, and some of them accumulate in some areas, and you have that. You have radioactivity naturally concentrating. Why would they have lead in the center of the cave? A lead, a lead foundation or a lead uh, container, the way he described it, was like uh, something had been in this. Uh, lead container, but it was buried under the floor of the cave. Now, well, frankly, why was I, the lead there? Frankly, I just do not believe this story. I mean, this is the kind of story you're always getting from out of the way places. Yeah. You and when you check up the check up on them, the whole thing collapses. And there's a type of mind that likes to build up mystery about these things, and none of these cases are ever substantiated. They all eventually evaporate, and re- people forget about them until the next mystery comes along, and then that evaporates. 
Uh, I remember this uh, this gentleman's name. It's been quite a while ago, and uh, the uh, I just recalled his name. His name is J. O. Kinnaman. Kinnaman, and uh, he was um, uh, he was um, uh, lecturing uh, on some, under under the auspices of some uh, some group that had paid for a lecture tour that uh, covered all of the uh, the state of California at this uh, particular time. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that this can be uh, uh, discovered as to whether there's any foundation or not. But he was telling about all of the uh, the archaeological finds in um, uh, in the, uh, the the ruins that have been uncovered. That I have seen uh, published photographs of these, and he had with him many of the published uh, photographs in the books of these various finds. That's a wonderful <laughs> ruins in South America. We know very little about the people who made them. But, uh, occasion, but there are all sorts of theories that the age of these, uh, some explorers claim that they're thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years old. But then the, you might say, the professional, astron- the professional archaeologists go along and examine them, and they have no difficulty in refuting all uh, these. These were professional ages. archaeologists. This man was, was with a professional group. And uh, the books uh, were by, published by this professional group, uh, group photographs, everything. And uh, they had been doing that work for 30 years in, in Egypt and in the Far East, uh, around the, um, the eastern Mediterranean area. They were the group that had been doing this for 30 years. Well, and they were professional archaeologists. Major, may I get in here to avoid what may be a confusion? Was the statement in this book published by the group of professional archaeologists that they had found evidences of a prehistoric race that used atomic energy, or was this just a sort of offhand lecture this, thing? This was a statement this man made. This was not and in this uh, book. I haven't published read. By no, the, I haven't. Uh, oh. I didn't read the books to uh, well, verify whether sure. it was in the book or not. I would take a take a bet that if you read, if the report has been published by some competent scientific organization, you will find none of this in it. This may be a speculation based on some report that is made. But if a thing like this is discovered by any scientific, any archaeological organization, this this would be headline news. This kind of thing doesn't remain spoken obscurely in some out-of-the-way lecture. This this hits the headlines of the world, and it's because these things are never proved that they're all nonsense. Well, I, I tend to disagree, because... Um uh, and the reason I disagree is because the history of mankind has been such that every new thing uh, was obscure. Uh, the Wright brothers' uh, plane, the news, uh, the news uh, reporter that went over to cover the Wright brothers' plane story couldn't even get the story published in his own newspaper. Why? Because it was contradictory to what the general belief of the time was. And uh, uh, engineers and scientists said that uh, it was impossible for a heavier-than-aircraft to fly. And they stood on their um, uh, on their scientific facts, and uh, still the planes are flying right today. Uh, but anything new that is contradictory to the general trend of thinking or thought, uh, it's just uh, almost impossible uh, for it to come out and uh, assert itself if it is in contradiction to what the general belief. I uh, would. Uh, this is a hold. complete misunderstanding. This is mm. not true. If a, if a new thing comes out, there's often resistance to it. But in a very short time, never under any circumstances, more than a few years, if anything new and important, which is true, comes out, it is imme- it is very quickly accepted. And after a while, there is no further controversy about the matter. The, big, the best proof of the non-existence of uh, spaceships from other planets is the fact that we are still arguing about it years after they're supposed to have landed. If they really were there, for example, this would have been settled completely without any shadow of doubt, just as there was no doubt that the Wright brothers flew after a year or so. I think it'll be completely settled within a uh, short time. I don't think there'll be any doubt except in the minds of uh, what I like to call hardheads. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with being a skeptic. Uh, uh, every person is skeptical about That's not true. That no, no, the trouble is that there are thousands of people who are not skeptical, and that's the trouble with this whole flying saucer business. There are thousands of people who are not skeptical enough. So, well, the, the non-skeptics, I feel, will be convinced. If there is reality in there, and I believe mm-hmm. there is, uh, they will be convinced, and I think within a reasonable time. I agree with you uh, completely. But I think uh, there will be some hardheads that will not be convinced, even if one hits them on the head. No sane person doubts evidence when it's conclu- conclusive and before their own eyes. Should we put those people that don't believe them in a That isn't quite right. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, if a flying saucer lands in New York, then anyone who doesn't believe in its existence should be in a mental asylum. But at the <laughs> moment, I think that most of the people who do believe in them should be in mental asylums. Well, Mr. Priestley, uh, 
fought the adoption, or I should say the uh, abrogation of the phlogiston theory by Lavoisier for years. In fact, at the time of his death by George, he still wasn't going to admit that it was right. Oh, yes, this, this so happened. So that doesn't mean there's the hardhead. Ah, no. This, this, this happens, often happens with individual scientists. The Goethe, for instance, stuck to a crazy theory of color vision for, until the day of his death. Uh, Newton fought against the wave theory of light. He never believed in the wave theory of light and held that back for for nearly a, nearly a hundred years. But things nowadays happen much more quickly than this. And if and if there's any uh, important new discovery, it's either very quickly, completely verified, or completely refuted. So uh, actually, I don't think there is a great disparity of approach to these things between any of us. I don't, I personally wouldn't want to accept anything just on uh, somebody's say-so, because there can be misinterpretation, personal misinterpretation. However, Mr. Clark, I, I could not go along with you in some statement you made earlier that the fact that contacts were reported in large numbers was a disproval. After all, this is an interpretation, again, of yours, because the larger number of reportings should indicate the more veracity to a situation. And again, a little later on, you said that when car lights were dimmed and cars stalled, somebody had nervous feet. Well, after all, four of these uh, 07 or 8 or 9 people involved were police officers, and they were not in the same car. Now, I think it's a little bit too much to expect that all of these men would be afflicted the same way unless they saw something that had a lot more to it than just a mental mirage, shall we say. Uh, another thing that you said was that Atlantis was disproven by borings. Well, uh, I believe I asked you there if they bored all the Atlantic, which uh, obviously they hadn't been able to at this time. Uh, so there would seem to me, although you made a very definite statement that Atlantis had been disproven, that there still would be a possibility that Atlantis might have existed. Corman, on this subject, you started to bring this up before. How large was Atlantis supposed to be? Charles, I haven't any idea. Well, I wondered. You seem to believe in it. The I point... think there's a good possibility, yes. I really do. The point is this. One does not have to bore every square inch of the Atlantic to disprove the existence of a large continent, which what Atlantis is considered to be. You just sort of take it every hundred miles, and you're okay. Yeah, but we I have maps of the, We have maps of these deposits, which are fairly accurate. Uh, the borings are only in a few places, but we have maps of these enormous areas of the deposit, this ooze, which covers most of the bed of the Atlantic. In other, in other words... thousands of feet thick. It's taken millions of years to accumulate. In other words, uh, you are satisfied that the borings to date have been sufficient to really have covered sufficient oh, areas. Oh, no, 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 but, they, but this is very no. striking evidence. It's not conclusive, and you have to sort of dig up the whole Atlantic, but if you have these gigantic layers of deposit which do cover millions of square miles of the Atlantic bed, we have taken bores in several areas, and it's, we find that in those areas it's taken millions of years for that ooze to build up, and this can be worked out quite accurate, like, like tree rings, like, you know, they can tell the age of a tree. And there's I, little doubt about it. Yeah, I haven't any vested interest in Atlantis, very obviously, but um, it, no the estate. possibility... <laughs> no, no real estate, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, I'd like to yes, just interrupt for a moment to remind our listeners that reports from Cape Canaveral, Florida, say there is an increased activity around the Navy Vanguard rocket project. Now indicating that a firing of America's second satellite into space may be imminent. Mutual reporter Dick Bate is standing by at the test site just in case a test comes tonight so that he can give us a first-hand report. So we'd like to suggest to you to stay tuned to WOR. Well, here we go back with, uh, with good old Atlantis. And as a matter of fact, off of Atlantis, from what I will have to support uh, Mr. Clark's contention about the thousands of cases of contact and disproving it, where we're talking about two different things here, there had been thousands of well-authenticated cases of people seeing the flying saucers or contacting them. This, is, this begins to mount up into evidence. Obviously, the more people who see them, the more likely it is that they are there. But when you have thousands of disputed things. That is the point, I think, that uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking for you here, Arthur, and you're perfectly capable. I think this is your point. When you have thousands of disputed yes. contacts, when nothing has been proven after thousands of things, then you yes. begin to wonder what's going on there. Uh, the explanation must be lie somewhere else. 
Uh, would you agree uh, uh, with these uh, two psychiatrists uh, in Carney, Nebraska, for instance, that um, uh, when the story of, um, of Reinhold Schmidt was added to some of the others, uh, along with the uh, Richard Kehoe um, uh, report of a landing contact near Long Beach, California, uh, that uh, was reported to have involved three stalled automobiles. Uh, these young fellows all were going to work in the morning, and three cars stalled, one right behind the other. They claimed that uh, a uh, spaceship was observed on the beach and that they spoke with two men that came from the ship. Uh, but in the Carney incident, um, these two psychiatrists uh, used this as a basis for their conclusion, uh, stated in the nationwide press, as a reason. That he was insane. No. They didn't say that he was insane. Oh, I thought, uh, I thought, sorry, I'm, oh, no. I'm on the wrong uh, track here. I'm... No, they said uh, that uh, Reinhold Schmidt told yeah. his story the same way each time. Uh. Therefore, he has a fixation, and he has uh. to have immediate, immediate mental treatment. And they send him to the uh, hospital very, very rapidly. Uh, according to Reinhold Schmidt's um, uh, report by letter and by tape recording, uh, he says he demanded every test they possibly had. He didn't uh, have any counsel. He had no jury trial. He had no kind of trial to determine whether he was uh, uh, mentally able or mentally ill or what. And he demanded, according to his own words, every test they could possibly give him. And he passed every test. Uh, then what, what about the psychiatrist's first report or statement that uh, due to the fact that he told his story, this was the basis for their conclusion, that he told his story the same way each time. Uh, should a man who reports uh, a, a sighting of a spaceship or a contact tell his story differently each time so that the psychiatrist won't attack him? Uh -huh. I think there's a, circular, there's a circular reasoning on the part of the psychiatrist. But my point is this, if these things are happening, and the Air Force is investigating them all, if there was any doubt, if they really had happened, all these reports, if something was really there, do you think there'd be any doubt about it by now? There's these teams of investigators, official investigators, going around at government expense. Are you suggesting that they are lying to the public? Uh, I, the Air I Force think there's a, uh, there's a great difference uh, in whether one of those investigators is in the active military service or out of the service. Uh, we have the case of Captain Ruppelt, who was uh, the Air Force investigator. Uh, and I have uh, before me a, uh, a document uh, from uh, NICAP in, uh, in Washington, D.C., this uh, worldwide organization uh, that has been reporting this for quite a considerable time. And uh, a statement uh, in here uh, by Major Kehoe, uh, some of the items that he was not allowed to bring into that Armstrong uh, circle program. Uh, they, these are three or four items that uh, that indicate that there is definitely something going on, uh, even within the active service. Uh, to me, the, uh, there are so many which are of uh, these sightings, Mr. Clark, which are reported by very long-term airline pilots, by radar operators, by. Uh, Ground Observer Corps people. There's a list here, I guess, about... There must be a hundred names there, of which uh, Dr. H. Percy Wilkins, one of your country... Now, wait a minute. Can I correct that? I don't think H.P. Wilkins has seen any. It's an H.T. Wilkins. Well, it says H. Percy Wilkins, noted British, British astronomer, world-famous lunar expert. Yes, well, he's been there. confused on H.T. Wilkins, who lives in the no. same area, and it's been very embarrassing to Mr. Dr. H. Percy Wilkins. Before we get into the discussion, I want to take care of a little business. They've just organized recently. Mr. Lester was kind enough to tell me something about it. And if you'd like further information, in other words, so many people write me letters, they'd like to know where they can sit around and talk with other people about saucers, how they can get into groups that are investigating saucers. Well, this is your opportunity. If you'd like information, just drop a card to NYSIB. NYSIB. Post Office Box 26, New York 24, New York. And I'm not kidding you when I say to you, that's the Planetarium Station, Square County. Huh. That's legit. That's no gag. Just remember, NYSIB, Post Office Box 26, New York, 24, New York, Planetarium Station. 
No, I don't know. Maybe they meet there or something. I don't know. Maybe it's an ideal place. I know many years ago I lived at that Hotel Colonial over there. And uh, there's quite a lot of space here right near Central Park. And who knows? Maybe they... Maybe they're going to land a saucer there. I guess they will. Uh, he explains what happened on the Armstrong Circle Theater. Is that right, sir? Uh, that's right. Uh, that's right, John. This um, uh, this letter is uh, just recently came out of uh, NICAP headquarters. And, uh, it's general information that was sent out to various persons that made inquiry to find out what happened. Uh, there were uh, uh, radio stations all across the country were uh, were flooded with mail and phone mm-hmm. calls asking why he was cut off of the air and they wanted to know... You mean television stations? Yeah, Mm -hmm. no, the radio stations. Radio stations, too. Radio stations, too. That's true, yes, they're news departments. While you're looking for the copy of that letter there, I notice you're you're trying to find it there. Let me just remind the people of the party line that this is WOR Radio, your station in New York, and this is Long John with the party line. We're around from midnight to 5.30, six mornings during the week. And uh, Major Aho will have that letter in a moment and he'll read it to us and... While we're waiting, let me tell you about this wonderful offer. Yes, I'll be uh, uh, very happy to, um, <clears throat> John. I think that um, it isn't a very long letter. I'll go ahead and read the uh, this whole item. It's stated uh, January 28, 1958. Uh, Dear friend, please accept my apologies for this form letter made necessary by hundreds of queries about the Armstrong Theater UFO program. The statement I began when cut off the air was as follows. In the last six months, we, NICAP, have been working with a Senate committee investigating official secrecy on unidentified flying objects. If open hearings are held, I feel it will prove beyond doubt that the flying saucers are real, and we urge citizens to co- to write the committee in Washington, D.C. This statement was discussed with a sponsor's representative, and he agreed it would get wide attention But later, the producer told me that since he personally was not informed, he had no choice under CBS rules but to cut me off. However, even though this action was not deliberate censorship by CBS, strong Air Force pressure previously had caused deletion of a vital statement from my script. This script contained a statement listing four Air Force documents never officially released, but which had been confirmed by the former chief of the Air Force Project Blue Book, Captain E. J. Ruppelt, and by another former project officer. The documents were, one, a September 23, 1947, secret conclusion by Air Technical Intelligence Center that the flying saucers were real. Two, a 1948 top-secret ATIC document concluding that the UFOs were interplanetary spaceships. Three, a secret Air Force intelligence analysis of UFO maneuvers, also concluding that the objects were interplanetary. Four, a secret report by a panel of top scientists convened at the Pentagon in January 1953, which urged, A, that the Air Force quadruple its UFO project, and B, that they give the American people all UFO information including secret Air Force conclusions, unsolved sightings, and photo analysis. These recommendations were officially rejected. According to one of the project staff, when my script was shown to the Air Force representative, he warned that the Air Force would immediately deny the document's existence if I were permitted to make the statement. This would also include denouncing the quoted source, their own former project chief, even though his book containing these items had been cleared by Air Force security and review, this Air Force threat, which appears to be censorship by intimidation, caused my planned statement to be cut off. In addition, though the program officials tried to present an impartial program, the Air Force insistence on an unfair share of the time forced me to delete many factual items refuting most Air Force claims. Among these were listing of official orders which silence armed forces personnel, citing of an Air Force letter to NICAP by Major General Joe Kelly, Director, Legislative Liaison, U.S. Air Force, refusing to release UFO reports and admitting they are classified for official use only. In case you wish to join us and help to make all the facts public, 
We are enclosing information on NICAP. Regardless, we appreciate your interest and your protest against secrecy in the, on this vital subject. Signed, Major Donald Kehoe. I think uh, you might be interested, Major, in hearing a postscript that is on a letter that I just received this week from Kenneth Arnold. I am not reading the entire letter. I'm waiting a couple of days because this is kind of exciting and maybe something more to it. However, the postscript is this. It might be of interest to you to know that one of our major airlines advised their pilots who had encountered in their flights unidentified flying objects not to appear on a program with Mr. Donald Kehoe. I don't mean to be evasive in not giving you the names of and the airline, but would you be but if you so desired as private information. But but would if you so desired as private information, I'm sure. However, I'm not going to ask him for sure. the names or anything like that. But it, it's an interesting uh, piece. I, I've received uh, some information from Mr. Arnold and uh, we might at some times use it on the on the air. At the present moment, I have no intention to. I have a lot of other material that uh, should prove uh, of yeah. great interest to our listeners as well. Major Aho, you also, uh, uh, I think, mentioned that you had some additional information about Mr. Schmidt, uh, the gentleman who claims that a flying saucer landed... Uh, uh, near him when he was out in Kearney, Nebraska? That's correct, John. Could you tell us about that, please? Uh, yes, John. Uh, might I uh, digress for just a um, uh, moment on this uh, Kenneth Arnold situation? I was listening to your um, program down at Washington, D.C. Uh, when Kenneth Arnold uh, appeared uh, immediately after the uh, Armstrong Circle Theater and explained on a telephone interview why he did not um, appear uh, on that Armstrong Circle Theater program. And uh, if I understand correctly, why his objection uh, was that uh, the uh, some real factual information was not being presented, that he knew of much better information or additional information that should have been uh, in this program. Uh, do I understand uh, that correctly, that uh, that was his yeah, reason that, for that? that was about it. Uh, as I recall the conversation, that he felt there were things that were being suppressed, that there were a full view of facts were not being was not being given yes well that's what i thought uh now on this um uh this reinhold uh, uh schmidt uh, story uh for anyone who isn't uh, familiar with the uh with the story from the beginning uh in that uh november uh what uh, many people now call flap uh any uh, great activity that occurs at a certain uh, place or at a certain time in any state or area is called a flap uh, but in the uh, November flap, uh, an incident was reported by uh, from Kearney, Nebraska, and it um, it got on a uh, nationwide um, uh, radio program, and I believe it was also on on television, uh, where uh, this Reinhold Schmidt uh, stated that he had been uh, driving his car near Kearney, and he had ob spotted an object in a uh, riverbed, the flat uh, riverbed, a dry channel. And he drove toward this object thinking that it was a balloon that had uh, somehow crashed or landed on the ground. Uh, when he uh, was near, when he uh, approached the object, his car stalled. And he um, uh, got out of his car and walked toward this object. And uh, uh, various uh, things happened uh, uh, then where he claims that he was um, uh, searched for weapons, that uh, two men came from this ship and searched him uh, for weapons. And uh, he this said I that they didn't recall, Wayne. Yeah, something new to me. I thought that they were pretty friendly on the way. Oh yes, they. Uh, he said they were friendly, but the first thing that happened, he said they turned some kind of a ray or something on him that held him motionless. He was paralyzed. He couldn't mm -hmm. move. And uh, uh, immediately after that, these uh, two men came and uh, sort of asked him if he were armed, mm -hmm. and he said he carried no weapons. But they searched him, and uh, then he was invited to go aboard the the ship. But uh, he stated that these uh, persons were uh, appeared friendly at all times, that there was no threats or anything like that. And they invited him to come aboard the ship until they were ready to depart, claiming that they were uh, making some repairs. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, he asked them where they were from, but they, uh, they did not say. Uh, they, uh, they said, 
uh, they made a statement according to his um, presentation of this that um, uh, tell your people that we mean them no harm and also they added that uh, soon your people will know uh, what this is all about and um, uh, he was aboard this uh, ship apparently for about um, 20 or 25 minutes uh, he has stated in correspondence that he hopes to come to Washington, D.C. and tell his story and uh, clear his name uh, from the um, uh, claim or the um, uh, the indication that he was mentally ill uh, because the, uh, the public has never been straightened out on uh, what finally happened. Uh, the last uh, many people know was that he had been sent to the state mental hospital. And uh, he hopes also to come to the uh, New York area, perhaps, that he can uh, get up here and appear on the program. Well, Major uh, Aho, there's one point in there that, unless I'm confusing the stories that you've left out, which seemed to me one of the most interesting facts, wasn't this the case where the man said that the saucer inhabitants spoke high German? Uh, yes, he said they, they spoke to him in uh, broken English. Mm -hmm. uh, he could understand them. But when they spoke uh, uh, with each other, they spoke uh, what sounded to him like a high German. Now, uh, whether he speaks German himself, I, uh, I don't know yet uh, for certain. His name indicates that he is perhaps of German ancestry. Well, this was... Perhaps he understands <clears throat> German, but uh, he, made that, uh, he made that statement. This is the point I haven't had cleared up because I have heard both stories that... Uh, not from him, understand, but secondhand reports that he just barely recognized the language as high German. And yet another report that he, in fact, understood it perfectly because he was a second-generation American and yes. uh, his parents spoke German or something. Uh, I am hoping to, uh, uh, while I'm in the Midwest area, if I can possibly do it, I want to interview him and uh, question him about uh, many of those fine points and find mm. out uh, exactly uh, what he observed, cover the whole... Uh, story, including the hospital experience and everything that happened, uh, in order to have a uh, complete picture on this. But uh, uh, immediately after this, um, uh, when this uh, he reported that when this craft was ready to leave, they told him that um, he would have to leave the ship. But they told him not to try to start his car; that it would not start yet until they had left. Mm -hmm. So uh, he left the ship and uh, he turned to uh, look, and he said it uh, left in a, uh, with a terrific speed. Um, uh, which again uh, uh, ties in with that um, the reported uh, landing uh, from Long Beach, California. This uh, Richard Kehoe tells down there that when he observed this uh, big craft uh, that was on the beach, uh, when it departed, they said it was left with a whoosh. It was like two automobiles passing each other at high speed. So um, uh, then he, um, he got in his car, uh, and I have heard... Um, uh, reports, I haven't had uh, definitely uh, had a chance to confirm this from Mr. Schmidt, uh, but I have heard a report that he went to see a minister first, and he was very startled and shocked by this um, uh, by this incident, and he went to see a minister first, and uh, then he went to see the sheriff to report the, the incident. Uh, in, his, um, um, in his tape recorded um, uh, interview that I have a, a copy of, uh, he states that he uh, asked the uh, authorities there to rope off this area to guard it so that uh, all evidence, all signs would be left there. And uh, he claims that he was told by the sheriff that it was not necessary to do this, that they had three or four other witnesses, and mm. uh, that there was no question of uh, whether the ship was there or not, that no further evidence was needed. And um, uh, the um, information uh, was given... Uh, by a letter that I received from a person in, uh, in Kearney that was um, uh, investigating this situation, uh, that the, uh, the authority there, the, the sheriff or the local um, uh, chief of police, made a, uh, made a statement uh, which was recorded uh, that they agreed uh, with this man's story, that they found tracks and uh, evidence that uh, corroborated his uh, original statement, and uh, they supported uh, his story. Uh, also, the, uh, the chief of police from Bakersfield, California, uh, supported uh, the man and his basic uh, honesty and integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, then, um, uh, many things uh, happened fast. Um, uh, the Air Force Intelligence and uh, apparently the FBI uh, arrived on the scene, and uh, uh, a great deal of questioning uh, took place. Um, I have a letter which states that... Um, 
He was questioned for 23 hours in a row, and uh, then after a few, uh, two or three hours of rest, he was questioned for about 18 hours more. Uh, I haven't uh, verified this definitely with Mr. Schmidt, but uh, I think that uh, we'll know in time exactly what happened there. Uh, then, too, um, um, from this uh, letter I have from Carney, uh, I have a statement that um, uh, two psychiatrists, um, and I have the names of the psychiatrists that arrived from the state uh, mental hospital, and uh, in questioning um, uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, then this situation developed where they said that he told his story the same way each time, and uh, they suspected him of having a fixation. And his... Um, uh, is in, in his uh, tape-recorded interview that uh, I have a copy of. Um, he states that upon arrival at the hospital, they asked uh, the doctors asked him what he was there for. And um, he said, it wasn't my idea to come here. He says, but being as I'm here, I insist that you give me every test possible uh, to um, uh, check uh, on my sanity. And uh, he states that this was done, and he spent a total of two weeks there, and then was released with a clean bill of health. Um, the situation develops that uh, he's working uh, again uh, as a grain buyer, as he was doing before this happened, and uh, working for a um, firm from uh, Raleigh, California, uh, known as the Value Pack Company, and he's right back in Carney, Nebraska. Um, he states that the, um, uh, he's trying to find the other witnesses that were involved, but there are several prominent people who have stated that there are witnesses present. Uh, but he says that these witnesses so far have been afraid to come forth. I fear that the same thing will happen to them that happened to him. You mean that they'll be taken to the sanitarium? Taken to the sanitarium. So what did the other uh, <coughs> other witnesses, were they supposed to have seen all this from a distance? Uh, him going into the saucer or just the saucer or what? Does he uh, I'm not certain uh, what the other witnesses uh, saw. Uh, I'm under the impression that they saw a, a ship either descending or taking on, and uh, that they didn't necessarily witness the... They weren't uh, close enough to see him being searched or no, going in or coming no. out or anything. And uh, uh, exactly what will develop uh, from that score, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not certain yet. But he, um, um, in his letters um, uh, to me, why uh, he has indicated that his, um, uh, his attorneys are not... Uh, uh, interested now in whether uh, his story is believed or not, that they mm -hmm. want justice in this case and they want the man's name cleared, and uh, they are suing apparently for damages. Who are um, they suing? Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether it's the city of Kearney or whether it's these individuals um, uh, that participated in this or uh, who it is. Uh, that's something that I don't know yet, as who is um, um, who the complaint is drawn up against. Um, I have another one. Another interesting item that uh, arrived in uh, a letter just uh, night before last, um, which is uh, also of, um, uh, of great interest. Um, this letter is dated uh, January the 30th. Um, uh, dear Major Aho, he... Um, this is from Mr. Schmidt? This is from Mr. Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And um, he states... Um, states here that uh, he is willing to uh, come to Washington, D.C., or any place to uh, to try to prove his point and that he is willing to uh, uh, pay even to the part of the expenses involved to try to clear uh, how does he, himself. How would he prove his point in Washington? This I don't uh, Well, I think, that, I think that what he is... Uh, um, uh, immediately after he uh, arrived back in Kearney, he was hopeful that he would get back on a national program mm. to show that he was out of the hospital and that he still insisted oh, on... That he could the, talk the, rationally yeah. and so forth, that he wasn't babbling and that's right. Other. And that uh, <laughs> he still uh, maintained the same situation that he claimed that he had been aboard the ship and that everything mm -hmm. that he had said was substantially true. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was not able to get on such a, a nationwide program. It was in the uh, developing, uh, but then it was suddenly canceled. So uh, he apparently is interested in uh, getting around the country and getting the word around mm. that he is there and he is not in the hospital. Um, also, uh, he made a statement here that he, uh, he'll he come if there's um, um, anything at all do done or if any, anything is arranged why he'll be very happy to go and try mm. to, to uh, clear his name. But he further states in this letter that... Um, 
And uh, this is of great interest because uh, it mentions something about the Air Force. It says, the Air Force has written me several letters. They are now quite interested. I uh, got a letter this morning from the Air Force at San Francisco, California. And uh, then he gives the address here, which um, uh, I'm not going to mention over the air because he doesn't want to um, uh, make this public because there are apparently some uh, cooperation going on. Uh, he... Let me slip a point in here. When you mentioned earlier that he'd been questioned for... 23 hours and then 18 hours. Was that by the local police or did the Air Force take any part in that? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the facts on uh, on that. That's one thing that yeah. I wanted to find out. Yeah. But this was mentioned in the letter that I received from some uh, some parties in Carney that uh, were investigating to find out exactly what happened. But he goes on to quote from this uh, the For- Air Force letter. He says, The director uh, wishes you success in your lawsuit against the idiotic individuals concerned. Thank you very much for the assistance you have rendered. And uh, then the signature and uh, the address of the party. This was a letter from the Air Force? This was a letter from the Air Force. Ooh, wow, that's strong language for an Air Force letter. Well, I, I don't doubt it, but no, I have this strong language. I have this, uh, I have this quote from him, but uh, apparently... Uh, I did notice in the, uh, in the news release that went nationwide... Uh, there was a little section right at the bottom that said that the federal authorities, I didn't mention who the authorities were, that the federal authorities were opposed to this type of action, meaning they're sending him to the mental hospital for examinations mm-hmm. and so forth, for fear that others who had uh, incidents, had experiences, uh, would refuse to report their information to the government. And uh, um, it might be that, um, uh, that the Air Force uh, had something to do with that. But uh, this letter, um, and he will, if this is true, he will have a copy of this letter, an official yes. copy of yes. it. Yes, he will. And uh, it, uh, there's pretty strong language there to indicate that uh, these parties that wrote to him are not um, uh, thought that some of this was a very idiotic handling of the situation. Well, let me take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors. I think uh, you mentioned sometime uh, this morning about a man by the name of Richard Kehoe. Is that a relative of Major Kehoe? Uh, no, uh, Richard Kehoe uh, states in a tape-recorded interview that he is not any relation to um, uh, Major Donald Kehoe, and Major Donald Kehoe has come out with a statement to that same effect. There's a very uh, interesting study here. Uh, here we have Major Donald Kehoe in Washington, D.C., the uh, director of, um, mm. of NICAP, a worldwide organization. And over in Long Beach, California, in the far side of the country, a Richard Kehoe... Richard. Does he spell it the same way? The same H-O-E way, on same the spelling, mm. yes. Uh, a Richard Kehoe, who states in, in a tape-recorded interview that I have a copy of uh, with me here, yeah. uh, that he ne- did not believe in flying saucers. And that he had uh, seen Major Kehoe's book in the book stand, but he never bothered to buy it because he just didn't uh, go for this uh, situation. And here on November the 6th, 1957, at about 5.40 a.m., uh, he reports that um, uh, he was driving to work uh, in uh, the Long Beach area there, and his car stalled suddenly when he was driving down the highway, and his lights went out. And he pulled over to the side of the road, and two cars following him uh, says the same thing happened to them. They says their lights went out, and they pulled up behind him. And uh, <laughs> uh, the amazing thing is that these fellows uh, say that uh, after they uh, they got out of their cars and they looked around to see what was going on, they saw a large ship parked along the beach that had uh, was landed right uh, about uh, 20 or 30 feet from the water's edge on the Long Beach there, and uh, that this, uh, he describes the size of this ship as being about 50 feet high and 150 to 200 feet long, and uh, he said that it had a blue haze surrounding the entire ship. Was this a saucer-shaped, saucer, that's a hard one to say, was this a saucer-shaped ship? Uh, well, the, uh, the, uh, it was more of a, of a cigar-shaped or an egg-shaped uh, object, the way he described mm-hmm. it. Uh, but uh, this uh, this word flying saucer has become so distorted now that usually yes, when you say flying saucer, they're talking about 
Either something sure. Uh, anything that um, that flies through the uh, the air that seems to be some kind of a controlled craft or, or is mm. on the ground, whether it's square or round or or saucer shaped, disc shaped, or saucer shaped ship. Or <laughs> I like that phrase. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, the uh, uh, <clears throat> they got out of their cars. And uh, they were observing this uh, this, this ship uh, on the beach, and um, uh, this Richard Kehoe was later interviewed by Paul Coates, a uh, a um, uh, news um, a radio announcer in that area. And uh, in the line of question that uh, that developed, why um, the um, uh, Richard Kehoe um, uh, indicated exactly how what he felt. Uh, about this whole situation. He was questioned as to whether this ship that they saw on the sand could have been actually an object in the water, some kind of a floating ship that they just misunderstood uh, or mis- mistook it or thought it was on the beach when it was actually in the water. And uh, he said that uh, they all agreed uh, and they were all aware that there was nothing in the water and anywhere within sight at that time. There's no craft in the water with any lights or anything and that the only object was this um, this ship on the beach. But the next amazing thing was the two men uh, approached them from the beach, and uh, they came up a little uh, stairway uh, up to the highway where these fellows' cars had stalled, and uh, these fellows were um, uh, were standing there, and apparently from the uh, tape-recorded interview, why their chins were hanging down. They were all just absolutely dumbfounded and uh, speechless. And uh, he described these uh, two men that approached them as being about five foot six or five foot seven, being about 135 to 140 pounds. He described the clothes they wore, that they had um, um, tight-fitting trousers uh, that were apparently black or dark in color. This was about 5.30 in the morning, so it was uh, quite early. Yeah, and, uh, they were, this happened when they were driving to work. And he gave the names of the uh, other two fellows involved. He gave their names um, as they were given to him as being Joe Torrance of uh, Joe Thomas of Torrance, California, and Ronald Burke of Redondo Beach, California. And um, the um, he described these uh, these fellows and their appearance at uh, at um, uh, quite um, uh, in a lengthy um, uh, interview, lengthy discussion. He said that they're, um, uh, they're, they had a very um, perfectly formed face, that it was the most perfect features that he had seen, that their, uh, their nose, their chin, everything seemed to be just absolutely uh, perfection, and uh, that their skin was of a, uh, of a different tint or different hue than uh, uh, what ours is. But at first, um, I noticed that uh, something that was very interesting here was that he practically insisted that these were earth people, that they couldn't have been space uh-huh. people because they looked so much like us. Uh, but then he proceeded to show them, uh, bring out various uh, things that he had noticed that would make them definitely different from earth people. But his insistence was very interesting that uh, he first felt that they definitely had to be earth people. But he later brought out the fact that their ears came to more of a point mm-hmm. uh, up at the top and uh, that their uniform, the clothes they wore, was uh, was somewhat different from uh, uh, what we wear, except that um, uh, it looked a little bit like a motorcycle driver's um, uh, uniform or outfit, especially because of the trousers, and that they had a large, um, uh, what looked like a large uh, belt with a um, with some kind of a carving or some kind of inscription over on the side, and uh, they wore shoes that had no laces, but they look to either be leather or pl- plastic. You couldn't tell in that light. Well, I've got shoes with no laces on right now. I don't know why that should interest him. Well, he just commented about that in, huh. in noticing uh, various things about them. And he said that they uh, didn't wear anything on their head, but their hair was cut fairly short. That they mm-hmm. um, It was like a college uh, crew cut almost. And their, their hair was about three inches long, you might say, in the longest point. Mm-hmm. And it was... Um, and... Um, it's curious that you them. should insist so that these were Earth people while at the same time pointing out all the things that... Yes, I thought it was uh, very, very interesting. Then he said that the uh, the color of the skin, uh, that they seemed to have a kind of yellowish or greenish tint to the skin. And he still said they were Earth people? He still said they were, they were Earth people. 
And uh, the uh, I think that the interviewer um, uh, probably noticed that um, uh, right away, and also the people that interviewed him later. But uh, he he was so st uh, struck by this whole thing. It may be that um, uh, he has never considered the possibility that these might come from space. Um, also, the um, uh, when he mentions um, uh, the interview that uh, took place, these fr these fellows spoke to them. He said that they spoke to him in a broken English. He sp they spoke to all three of them, mm -hmm. and they all witnessed this uh, situation. That they spoke in broken English, or what seemed like uh, 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 like a foreigner would uh, speak American that was not familiar with the language. But they, he said they didn't have any trouble understanding them. That they clearly understood what they meant. Uh, the questions asked ran right along uh, this line: uh, that, uh, "What time is it? Uh, what is the nearest city? Uh, what is the nearest city to where we are?" And these fellows uh, told them wh what city this was, and so forth. And uh, there was um, there was something uh, mentioned or asked about where are they going, meaning the three drivers that were stalled there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them asked uh, these two fellows as to where they were from, and they received no answer whatsoever. They didn't reply at all. And uh, he was asked as to whether they seemed to be friendly or hostile or what, to, and he said they appeared to him to be very friendly. Uh, in describing their uh, their uh, uh, their attitude, their behavior, they he, they asked him um, uh, just how did he feel about them, and he said, well, in appearance, it's as if um, if I uh, uh, saw a perfect FBI man, it says these fellows would have been a perfect description of an FBI man, you might say, uh, that they seem to be completely composed and have and complete control of the situation. Perfect green FBI man, <laughs> something. A very strange way to describe an FBI man. And he said that they, uh, it says if you, um, uh, <clears throat> if you were sitting in a poker game, and uh, if you had a perfect poker poker face that did not show any uh, emotion or uh, or any um, uh, any uh, any sign of any excitement of anything, he says these fellows had a perfect poker face. He says they didn't bat an eye. Hmm. And um, the. Um, uh, when they left, they said that they uh, they turned on their heel. They didn't say goodbye. They didn't say anything. But he said he didn't have a feeling uh, that he personally didn't have a feeling as they were uh, cutting off the interview and uh, and uh, uh, showing any kind of um, um, uh, resentment that they when they they were like well trained troops that when they left they turned around and left uh, without any hesitation and they uh, they marched down the beach. They got into the ship. They saw a beam of light come out as they went enter the ship in some opening, and he said immediately after, when they got aboard, he said the ship left with a whoosh. He said it's the most fantastic thing he ever saw. It sounded like two cars passing each other at high speed on the highway, and that's all the noise there was, and boom, it was gone. And they asked him, well, um, well, how did he feel about it afterwards? He said, well, we walked slowly to our cars, and he says, if you can uh, describe a fellow who's just been cleaned out in a poker game, he says, that's how we felt. Mm -hmm. We were just absolutely dumbfounded. I'm a little dumbfounded at this uh, point, too. Yes. <clears throat> but I'll have to do a little piece of business. This is long gone. Oh, you're on already? I can't stop it. Long gone. Long gone. Don't put me on the beach. Oh, you're on already? I can't stop oh, it. Okay. I sent a letter to you about the zombies, you know, that, remember? Yes. I told you about the zombies. I know. Yes. You told me to send it on the care, uh, for Dave Bell care of you. Yeah. But I don't hear Dave Bell anymore. The... Oh, you, Did you, you just... get the letter? Huh? I, I, I don't know. He hasn't told me it yet. Oh, oh. But I, I, I typed that off the article from Fate, you know, yeah. you remember? We're, incidentally, we're going to have the editors of Fate magazine with us on Friday night. Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Saturday morning, yeah. Could you ask Dave Bell to give it up? To them? It would be, uh, oh, I certainly will, as soon as I, I see Dave. I've typed it off four big pages. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Well, one of our nice listeners, and uh, as I say, uh, we'll have the people on from Fate Magazine, the editors, and I think you better be tuned in even a couple of minutes before 12, because I understand we're going to start right out and uh, 
that's going to be so exciting. I've been told by William the Preston that uh, we may even have them a second night. In other words, not two consecutive nights, but uh, have them oh. back again Tuesday. So be on early, early, everybody. Major. You know, uh, <clears throat> John, I've been uh, observing uh, Mr. Leadham here um, all the evening, uh, and after uh, due consideration, I'm convinced now that he is a Venusian. Uh, he sat here all uh, this night for uh, almost five and a half hours, and his show was absolutely uh, 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 no weariness whatsoever, and uh, I'm convinced he's a Venusian. Well, Major, you are mistaken, I'm sorry to say. It is not Venus. It is, in fact, the planet Jupiter. Yes. And this well, is, that's the bigger planet. This is this is why I happen to be the size I am, because I come from Jupiter. And you'll notice that I'm sitting in a special chair here. The actual truth is that I weigh 3,200 pounds. And if it weren't for the special <laughs> construction of this chair, I splintered several the first time I was up here on the show, and John had to order this one for me. It's a very touchy situation. I don't generally like to talk about it on the air, but we... Uh, the we Jovians do not sleep. We found it uh, very handy that way. You uh, you had get much more time there to accomplish yeah, we, things. We have more time to build uh, saucers and think of the uh, basic principles of the universe and to, uh, uh, you know, try and exist on this lousy planet. And this is Jupiter, <laughs> not Earth. Earth is a great place, but this lousy <laughs> planet that we were born on, it's, it's a real rough fight, kids, I tell you. It takes... 47 hours a day. The Jovian day is 47 hours long. I thought it was uh, 46 and a half. Well, that's in leap years, John. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nine minutes after <coughs> five. five Earth minutes time. Take you might call. want to announce this Earth time. Earth time. Mm -hmm. Hi there. This is Long John. Oh, Long John. Yes, sir. Uh... I'd like, I'd like to mention something that I thought of, not seriously, yeah. but the more I think of it, the more possibility there is in it. Yeah. And perhaps all you people might explore it. All right, sir. Since the moon is, is sometimes referred to as a dead planet, perhaps it could be used as a burial place. Since the moon is referred to as a dead planet, it yeah. could possibly be used as a burial place. In time. In time. It would stop the uh, people from competing for the moon. It would stop the people the from competing for the moon. Yes, perhaps we could decide right now to uh, not to compete and try to rule the world. I'm in a bad position and I can't go. Um, uh, I, I really am not serious about it, but it sounds like it could be used in, uh, in the... In, in, in discussions. In discussions. Yeah. All right, sir. What possibilities are there? These people might end up in limbo someplace. Yeah, well, we... we All they have to do is fill the rockets with... Our dead, with all due respect to our mm -hmm. dead, and just pile the rockets one on top of the left up there. We may discuss it some morning, all right? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for calling, sir. Not at Hope all. you get better, sir. So. Well, that was another idea. I see one of my good listeners just telling mm -hmm. me that uh, we're into uh, February. Good yeah. right. And I... What have I said? What have I been saying? I've been saying February. I don't know what you've been saying. February. Yeah. I've been listening. And it should be what? Well, you're not, you're not disputing this man's spelling because it's correct. No, 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 no. It's February. Well, I think if you have February, but no one, no one gives the first star February. Well, this, this nice person would like to have me try it this year. Would like to have you try February? Well, if uh, if he says February, well, he's going to get some strange looks from people that he's talking to. I don't know. I don't know. February. Feb February. February. Everyone says I February. I say February. 
I'm sure that Winston Churchill says so do I, for that matter, if he ever happens well, he's, to he, say he it. He hasn't even been he on the program. He may quiet throughout the month. I don't know, just to avoid this particular culture tone. That's uh, a funny thing. You know, we've never been able to book him on the program. I tell you what, I know a fellow in, um, in Philadelphia that looks so much like him that uh, that'd be, he'd, he'd be sure yeah. to get away with it. <laughs> See, well, I understand you were in uh, Philadelphia off. with Major Kehoe's short time ago. Uh, with Major Kehoe? Yeah. Well, no. No, I lectured to the uh, to, uh, groups in Philadelphia. And you were not well, there I... with Major? No. Oh, no. Oh, W. I don't know. I, I heard someplace there. Uh, I think it was the day that they called me up about Schmidt. Hi there. This is Long John. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. No, but I had one time a gentleman called me, called me two or three times, and he wanted to bring over uh, a Martian that they had uh, captured. Oh. And they, well, first of all, we had to air the studio out for an hour beforehand, no smoking in the studio, and they wanted to bring in a special piece of equipment to cleanse the air. And uh, they... Me? brought them in and they, oh, they want to know if we have AC current. And they have a special garment for them and they plug it into the AC current to keep them warm. It's too bad you didn't invite them over. No, been, no, uh, I, I didn't. An interesting guest. Yeah, it would certainly would have. But I mean, on TV it would have been great. Hmm. Hi there, this is Long John. We were pretty good. Enough. This is Long John. Uh, hello, Long John. How are you today? Pretty good. And how are you? Yeah, fine, thanks. Uh, you know, turn your radio down, Leo. <laughs> yes, Leo. Hello. Hello. Leo. That, that's a very funny thing. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that that was Leo K. Handel. Sounded like him, didn't it? Russ? And uh, I told him to turn down his radio or turn it off, and he must have disconnected the phone. I don't know. That's right. Well, um, Doberman, can we got anything? Well, here, what's this? Dobermans can be gotten from Mrs. William B. Hill, West John Street. Hicksville, Long Island. Phone number is Wells 10151. And this is Croes, K R O E double S, of Broad, what? Bronx? Oh, Bronx. Yeah. Well, what is all this about? I don't know. Somebody got to do We don't want Dover. Hello. We want miniature ducks. And that's no, I didn't want to buy a Dover. I've got Dover. Oh, no, I guess, no. I, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ray. No, this lady is very nice. She thought I wanted to buy a Dover. No. I was looking for a miniature... Dachshund. Dachshund. We've got, I've got Dobermans up to the eyeballs. We no. don't need any more of them. No, uh, no I thought I would have one. But, uh, oh, I know there are places I can buy them. It's just a matter that I haven't had the time to uh, well, get over there. It takes the, the trouble is that it takes a lot of time. As I, uh, no. pardon me if I get no plug for that magnificent volume of obedience training by Charles Medium. Uh, it, in the first chapter, talking about getting a pup, as I said, it takes a long time because one of the one of the worst things you can do is go and look at one litter of puppies because there is nothing which will knock your sales resistance quite so hard as a litter of tumbling pups, and you've got to really get it up to the highest notch and go and look at two litters and three litters and four litters and five litters and take your 
take your pick out of that. And this takes a great deal of time, which is why it's difficult to uh, to get around and find a min docs like that. Well, it's very nice of these people to call yeah, out. Yeah, it was thoughtful. I'm sorry that they, they got the wrong breed, though. Miniature dachshunds we want, Dobermans we've got. Yeah, well, now we know, though, that Mrs. William B. Hill... Is that the lady who called, Mrs. Hill? Oh. She lives on West John Street in Hicksville, Long Island. Oh, that was very mm -hmm. nice, sir. Yes? I don't want to Mrs. H. Peters of Andover, New Jersey. Well, what can I do? What can yes. I do? Oh, they have miniature Dobermans over there. Oh, I say thank you. Miniature Dobermans we want. Dachshund, uh, that's what we want. How, how big is a miniature Doberman? Oh, he stands about... Uh, what, what, what's the seven? Nine, point? ten inches high. Seven pounds? They're very tiny little kids. They're not miniature dog, miniature pinchers. You have to get that straight. Well. Nine, ten inches high, maybe, and they weigh very, practically nothing at all. They're very what cute little dogs. What do they cost dogs. about? Well, it's uh, hard to say. Uh, the average pup costs you about 150. Mm. Uh, let's talk about something else. Let's take a <laughs> Hi there, this is Long John. What happened to you? Long John. Hello, John. Same what happened to you? I don't know. Oh. I just went to turn that radio down a bit and just yeah. reached over to turn the dial, came back and got the dial tone. Yeah. I remember the last time I called, it was a sort of, uh, you know, old tongue-in-cheek call, you know, from uh, Ecuador. And, um... Ducks, just as I was uh, trying to tell you something, uh, some kind of uh, uh, ambulance or something went by with a little spy yeah, on it, yeah. and um, uh, that was it, and I got a dial tone. It looks like somebody really sabotaging us. I don't know what's happening. Well, I don't know. I How's guess, things going, Leo? Oh, pretty fair. No complaints. Uh, I meant to drop in a uh, visit here, you know, but then every time I want to come over, something else turns up and makes it impossible. We've got we've got a few uh, uh, letters here and all. I'll tell you what I want you to... Wait a minute. you got some stuff on Leo K. Hendel, haven't you? There. You know what you could do? You want to take my phone out of that line and, and plug it into uh, the line with Leo, and when I get off the beeper, will you take his address so we can send it, huh? We got a couple of cards here for you, Leo. Leo, uh -huh. I don't know what they are or anything, but don't give me your address now. In other words, when we, uh, uh, when you and I are through talking, we're off the beep. Uh, right. uh, listen. Yes, Leo. Uh, well, um, uh, what I called up to say uh, was that uh, I'm very, very interested in the fact that there's a possibility that you might be on early. I, for one, would make it a point to listen in, and I have friends, you know, who can't stay 
up as late as I do. And uh, when I tell them of the program and tell them what goes on, uh, well, they stay up and listen to one or two programs, but then, you know, they got to go out and earn that bread, you know, in order to live. And so they can't, you know, spend that time. And they always say to me, gee, wouldn't it be great if you were on a little earlier? You know, we'd love to listen to that. In fact, we might even, uh, you know, uh, take a real interest, especially in Homer Boomer. In fact, there's a, there's a gigantic move here now in Newark to form a Homer B. Boomer uh, society, you know, whose main purpose would be to uh, uh, propagate the name and fame of Homer B. Boomer, the rightful inventor of the boomerang. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have a lot of candidates, including uh, members of the Newark Police Department, whose names I won't mention, because these men are very interested in joining, you know. And uh, they're all in favor of Homer B. Boomer. Well, fine. Uh, well, well and if something happens that. on that, I'll let you know. Thank you, Leo. And, Leo, uh, wait a minute. Uh, are you ready, Dave? All right. Take me All off right. the people. Take I it can't off there. Take, take my radio's off. All you right. Know. So long. So long, John. Ian, this is WOR Radio, your station in New York, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up for another morning. In another couple of minutes or so. I don't know what it is. I feel really worn out. I guess it's because I haven't been to bed for about 30 hours. We were running around like mad lining up that uh, phone call from Canaveral yeah. for about half an hour, which is enough to wear anybody out. Uh, hey, John, I wondered, uh, have you heard any uh, new uh, good uh, interplanetary jo- uh, jokes on the interplanetary orbit lately? Has anything new come in on that interplanetary orbit? No, no. Do you know something? No, I've, uh, I've run out of jokes. I, uh, I told uh, the last ones I'd heard. I just wondered if you'd had heard any new ones. No, it. no. You know, from time to time in the mail, but I'm just catching up with some of the mail that I've had on hand, and... Uh, we're uh, <clears throat> trying to get it sorted out. We certainly appreciate the fact that the people on the party line are kind enough to send in the cards and letters. Sort of brings us up to date uh, as to what they think about the program. And, uh, well, who knows? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. The only joke I can think of, you play bridge, don't you, John? I haven't played bridge in years, and I, I forget. Now, is that what you use the cue stick with? Is that the game? No, the, the, you use the mallet, you know, and oh, you have the little oh, hoops on the wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, I knew it was something like but that. The horrifying story, the other night, Betty and I had been thinking we'd brush up on our bridge, so we went over to some friend's house, and we were talking, and said, uh, you people don't play bridge, do you? And they said, oh, well, we're not very good at it, but, you know, we play. And so we said, well, let's, let's try a few uh, rounds and see what happens. So we sat down at the table and got the cards out and got a score and everything, all ready to play. And you may not believe this, but the guy says to me, I'm a little dim on it. How many cards do you deal to a person? <laughs> so we folded up the table and folded up the cards and went away. And that's my sad story to the night. <laughs> oh, man, that was too much. How many cards do a person? Ooh, huh. Major, do you see uh, Major Keyhoe often in uh, Washington? Uh, I do once in a while. Um... However, our, um, uh, we're both so so busy that uh, yeah. it's just a madhouse all the time. Um, I'm finding the quarters up in Congress or or um, uh, traveling around the uh, the country, but uh, I try to spend quite a bit of time up in Congress because I think it's quite important, and they're very much interested in getting more interested all the time mm-hmm. on the hill. What do you think of the move to go out in the Mojave Desert with lots of cans of white paint and? make a huge sign with letters about three miles high saying Martians go home. <laughs> you, you go along with that? <laughs> no. No, that would take a lot of the load off of, uh, <laughs> off of you and Major Keo, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the funny bit, Charles. Very, very good. We'll have to use it on the air sometime. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, I think it would have been great if we would have been on the air tonight. It was a night off, though. Well, yeah. this way we're, we're going to be, you know, all rehearsed for tomorrow night. Yeah. Or for tonight, or was it yesterday night? I get a little confused about this. What is this? This is uh, Saturday? Or... I think this is the second Thursday in the week or something like that. I think you're right. Yeah. It's, it's, it gets confusing around here. This is either tomorrow night or yesterday morning. I'm not sure which right now. Well, I can tell you one sure thing. that It's really been a pleasure shocking with the people on the party line. And my name is Gift Campbell. I'm around from 12 to 5.30. Rodney Dexter playing the part of Alan. <laughs> and I sincerely hope that 
Many of the people on the party line will send a card or a letter to me. Gift Campbell. Send it to W-O-R. <laughs> That's Harry Carlson, your sunrise serenader. He'll be along in just a couple of minutes. Don't forget my time. That's right. <laughs> Neighbors, I think we'll have to wrap it up and we should at least have one minute of silence in respect for the great Gift Campbell. The gentleman that has done more to keep radio where it is today. Forty <laughs> percent better than ever before. Ah, that's it. Thanks very much, Major A. Ho, for joining us. We appreciate it a lot. Thank you, John. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, I know that the people listening to the program will certainly be happy to go over to the New York Center, where Major A. Ho and Cortland Hastings will be giving a lecture on thir- Thursday. Is it Thursday night? Thursday, Thursday night. night. That's right. Russell Ticklepaw, engineer, and uh, Al Nielsen, the old junk man. And we'll all be back with you again tonight at midnight. And I hope you'll be junk. So if you're getting up, I sincerely hope you have a very, very pleasant day. And don't forget to stay tuned to Harry Carlson and John B. Gamble. Get a good night's sleep. And sleep real good. Bless you. Thank you.